This is the College of Complexes, and tonight we have with us a uh, and Sheets and Will Barnes. Will Barnes. The proposition is uh, that we should change uh, Obamacare, Medicare, and Social Security, uh, probably because it's all going broke. Uh, Bill, Will Barnes will speak. Uh, you'll have 15 minutes, and then Ann Sheets uh, will uh, speak then uh, for 15 minutes, and then they will uh, bill and then. Uh, okay. Uh, will, are you ready? Yes. I'll uh, be chiming for 15 minutes. I'll give you a, a cue when it's when it's close. You know, just like a three, two, one. I'll give you like a sign with with my hand for like three minutes, two minutes, and then a minute. Sounds good to me. So let me let me uh, always ask you to come back for this all this body. Since the public is about a fifth time that I've uh, had the opportunity to speak at the College of Complexes. And the reason why I, I wanted to do this topic today, is it okay? The reason why I wanted to do this topic today, because I received Medicare and I received Social Security. So that's a, that's a very sensitive topic for me. And not only that I receive it, I'm also concerned about the, the booking program being available for my daughter and my grandchildren, as well as the problem, the, the, the possibility that if these programs are not solved and, and not made secure, it's going to run our country into a situation where I think we're going to need to recognize our country perhaps 10 or 15 years from now. But let's, let's talk about Social Security first because it's the oldest. It's one of the, it's the oldest social Thank program. <laughs> social Security came into existence in 1935, as we, most of us Potato know. It was sold to us as a social insurance program in 1935. Now, it is anything but a social, a social insurance program. I look at Social Security system as well. So you can compare the social security system has a wooden nickel to a hundred dollar bill. If you look at your, if, if anybody who try to <coughs> describe the social security system as an insurance plan for retirement, it's, it's, it, have to understand that that is a complete lie. Let's make, let's make sure we understand the difference between social security system and, let's say, in, a, in an actual insurance plan that's going to provide for your retirement. Now, the Social Security system was actually designed wrong from the get-go. It, 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 an average insurance company, it might just it take a few minutes, and once, once you get some time, and look at the financial statements of whatever insurance company you have in your life insurance policy was. Take, take a few minutes and look at that financial statement. Here's what you'll find if you take a, you take a few minutes and look at the financial statement, is that there's a line in there that says reserve. Or the company has to reserve money to pay claims. By law, it has to reserve money to pay claims. Now, if they don't have that reserve to pay claims, they would be disqualified to actually operate in the state of Illinois. Why is that? Because if the company don't pay the claim, the state of Illinois is obligated to pay the claim. Because the company has to be approved to function in the state of Illinois. So when you look at that line in the financial statement, they have to say reserve had to have so many millions of dollars in reserve in order to pay claims. Total opposite from the Social Security system. No money is held in reserve for any of us to collect when we get to retire. So how is, how is Social Security payment actually made? It's made on the basis of current people working and paying into the system. It is a pay-as-you-go system. If I understand that it works, the pay as, as young as young people quit work is paid. That's it is how I get my social security. Or anybody else who's over 65 gets their social security. The fact that people are working and paying into the system. The system this last year started to hemorrhage. 
more money was getting paid out than was coming in. Seriously, more money was paid out than was coming in. It's time to image, to image last year. So you got a fluctuation going on now. You got so much more money may be coming in, so much more money be going out. But at the end of the year, the end of the year we had more money going out than coming in. That was the problem with Social Security system last year. And anybody who disagree with that, you can go back and check, check any type of statistic you want to check on the Social Security system. We will tell you that. All right. So let's so under the so, so so let's make sure we make that distinction between a legitimate retirement program and Social Security system. Now let's think about it this way. You ask the question: Do you own your Social Security benefits? The answer is you don't own your Social Security benefits, but the government owns your Social Security benefits. The government can change it, can change it, change the age in which you can receive it, and can change the amount in which you can receive it at any time they want to. You got five hundred and thirty-five jokers in Congress who can make those changes whenever they choose to. <clears throat> so these are the people we trust. These are the people we are trusting our retirement to. These five hundred and thirty-five jokers in Congress. Now you feel safe, you feel satisfied with that? Fine, I don't. The whole the system has to be changed. Now let's think about it this way. Let's say, let's say you spend, you take forty dollars a month for the next thirty years. You put it in the bank, <clears throat> and then after you get sixty-five years and you retire, you go to the bank. Say, I want to take my money. Bank will tell you, I'm sorry. No money. We can't honor your, we can't honor your request. Ain't no money in your, ain't no money in your account. It's all been spent. And that's essentially what's going on now. All the money has been spent. The money do not, any time you hear a politician tell you that there's this, there's this so-called trust fund. Any time a politician tell you that they are telling you a lie. Okay? Only time a politician is not lying is when their lips are moving. You need to understand that. Just be clear on that. So what we have to do is take, take that, take that, Seriously, and say, okay, if we don't, if I don't own my social security, if I don't own my social security benefits, what can I do? What is my alternative? Uh, so that's what we're going to talk about. What is the alternative if you don't own your social security benefits? What is that? Right. Now, one of the one of the options that has been has been considered. And I think it's a very viable option. Fact, by the way, the, the uh, First of all, we talk about fairness. I'm, I'm thinking of fairness. Wait a minute. The average Social Security payment for every person across this country is roughly about $1,100 a month. Okay? And that's a person who perhaps paid about, work, averaged about $40,000 a year for them, generally for them, you know, the last time that they work. They'll end up getting roughly about $1,100 a month. Now, I got a friend who recently retired from from working for the state. Now his pension is roughly about four thousand a month. Okay. Now, what is that fair? That's another person who can work that period of time, same amount of time that he works uh, and, and from Social Security, get roughly about eleven hundred dollars a month, and he gets about roughly about four thousand. Where's the fairness? In that? The, so, so the, 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 the first one to talk about fairness, and that's where you can start it. We got over, we got over 4,000 Illinois employees right now getting over 100,000 dollars a year in retirement. Where's the fairness in that? Okay, so we're going to talk about fairness. I, I have no problem with people getting 100,000 dollars a year in retirement or 4,000 dollars a month. I have no problem with that. I just want everybody to get it. You know, let's everybody have a nice retirement. That if you, most people say you can't have a good, good decent retirement as a couple that you get about fifty thousand dollars a year. Then you have a decent retirement. Less than that, probably gonna be kind of rough. Alright, so Take if we're gonna talk about retirement, let's, let's make it fair. If one if one group, if one segment of this of this population, the workforce, can have a great retirement, then let's everybody have it. Okay? Now let's talk about how this is, the social security system we're on. I'm going to get into the social security system. I'm going to talk about Medicare, and then we're going to talk about Obamacare. Now, I don't, I, I don't uh, uh, use Obamacare pejoratively. I mean, it's just, you know, I use it because 
I think this craft was actually what it is. I mean, it is a, a, a program that went into existence virtually without any, any. I mean, it's a one party type of program. The Republicans did not vote on this at all. All Democrats voted on this. Obama signed it in the law. We got a problem here. So that's why I get into that. Let me finish up with Social Security. Now, let's, let's, I think a great illustration about the Social Security system is, is taking a hard look at the first recipient of Social Security. Ida Mae Fuller. Everybody heard of this? Ida Mae Fuller, right? Huh? No. Ida Mae Fuller was the first recipient of Social Security. You know how much you paid into the Social Security system? $44. You know how much you collected? $20,996. That's a pretty nice return, right? That's a fantastic return. Right. How did you get that kind of return? Did, did the government invest in the money? Some great investor in, 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 uh, for my 535 junkers invested this money? Did you get this great return? How did she get this money? She lived until she was 75 years old, and all the folks who were working at this time paid into the system, so she got up to her $20,996. Okay? So that's how the pay-as-you-go system works. Right. That's how they made for it. That's our first recipient. Now, so let's talk about how the system, the social security system, can be saved. Now, one of the things that, one of the ways I think the system can be saved is, is the notion of equalizing the retirement system in this country. If you equalize the retirement system in this country, everybody would have a 401 cap. Right, everybody would have a 401k, nobody would, and nobody's retirement system would be guaranteed. Okay? So everybody would be in the same boat. That's one way we can get it solved. So everybody was so so you have to be concerned about okay. So then we, then we don't have to be concerned about the system here in origin because there's more money going out than coming in. Right? So it, but everybody then would own their retirement plan. 535 people in Congress would not own it anymore. You would own your own retirement plan. You would decide how the money is to be invested. You, if, you, if, you, if, you want, if you want safe investment, you can put it into a safe investment vehicle. If you want, if you want to take some risk, you take some risk. Okay, but that, but that is, the point is that you would have the decision to make in terms of how you want to be invested. Not these 535 people in Congress. Now, I'm going to touch a little bit about Medicare, and then I'm going to have to stop. Medicare is a more recent program. It's the law of 1965. It was sold to us as a Medicare insurance program. It is not a Medicare insurance program. You have a situation right now, the hospital and trust fund is, is, set to, is, is, is projected to run out in 2016. Roughly about four years from now, all the money in this so-called hospital trust fund that funds Medicare is going to run out. Any politician that tells you who's running for office, who don't have a plan <coughs> to save Medicare, ought not be voted for. The simple ought not be voted for. If you don't have a plan to save Medicare, you ought not be voted for. See, the problem is that they don't, they don't, it, it, if it's a situation where they don't have to look forward to have to, to, to live under Medicare, then they don't have to make those, they don't care about making those decisions. Those of us who have to, and our children and grandchildren, who are actually paying into the system, ought to feel, ought to feel secure that this plan program is going to be around and get ready to retire. Otherwise, that money is being stolen from them. That money is actually being stolen from them. And, and, and they're being lied to by the politicians. So we have to look at, okay, how can, how, how can Medicare be, be savage if it's going to still be around, or, or should it be replaced totally for people who's coming into the system 55 and younger? See, what's happening right now is that you have a couple of plans that's on the table. You have an existing plan called Medicare Advantage, which allows competition among companies to compete for the senior health care. Now, that, that's, that's, that is the concept that I think is going to is, is tend to be more workable than anything else. If you have the, the single Medicare Part D, which is a prescription plan, which actually has the 
senior, and I actually have puppies compete for the senior prescription, I mean, for the drug plan for seniors. That drives the prices down when you have competition. So we have to look at how the competition, how can competition be put into place to make sure that Medicare can still be around and not be insolvent in the next, in the next four to five, the next, actually the next five, four to five years. So that's what it is, that's the other part. Now, I'm going to touch on, I'm going to touch on Obamacare and then I'm going to stop and then I'll come back and we'll get into it a little bit more. Now, Obamacare was, was signed into law. Uh, when it was signed into law, we would, everybody had, it was signed into law with this notion that everybody's going to have, it's going to be a universal health care for everybody. Right? Now, as we know that the Supreme Court is going to start hear oral argument about the constitutionality of this of Obamacare starting next month. Because of the individual mandate which said, which tells us everybody's going to have to either choose this health care plan or you're going to be fine. The argument is that the government should not, and cannot, does not have the authority constitutionally to make people buy anything. If we can make you buy health care, then it can make you buy a certain type of car, which is what apparently the president would like to do anyway, make us all buy electric cars or whatever. God bless you. Um, but anyway, the constitutional is going to be challenged. And by the end of, by, perhaps by, by the end of the summer, by the end of the summer, we're going to be a decision one way or the other. Now I want to stop for, for you know, time being and I'll come back and I'll get into a little bit more of that. But the next speaker needs to take the microphone at this point. Promoting quality care. 
and a contemporary healthcare system has to be integrated and cooperative. If you get sick, if you if you are walking down the street in a snowstorm, you're an elderly person, let's say, and you have a heart attack in the cold wind because you're exerting yourself and you fall down and break a hip. What do you need from that point on? You need emergency services. Somebody has to come and pick you up off of the street and take you to the hospital. When you get to the hospital, you need an emergency room set up. So you're going to be seen by a nurse, a doctor, um, a technician who's going to do your EKG, somebody who's going to draw your blood. Um, you're going to have an x-ray of your hip. The x-ray of the hip has to be read. The blood test has to be run in the laboratory and interpreted. You have to see uh, an emergency physician. You have to see an orthopedist. You have to see a cardiologist. When your hip is repaired, you have to have an anesthesiologist do your anesthesia. Afterwards, you have to have nurses. You have to have a rehabilitation specialist. When you go home, you have to have physical and occupational therapy to get back on your feet. Of course, you might die. This is two very serious illnesses, a heart attack and a hip fracture. Those are both serious illnesses. You might die. But still, you have a very good chance, if you were somebody who was up and walking in the snowstorm, you have a very good chance of surviving both of those, provided that you have competent care, integrated care, all of those things working together to get you better. Now, what happens if you have commercial health insurance when you fall and break your hip? And, okay, so you're going to get, you're going to be called 911. Okay, that's taken care of. Then you get to a hospital. The hospital may or may not be in network for you. If it's out of network, you may have to pay a substantial portion of the bill. The emergency doctor might be in a different network than the hospital. The radiologist who reads your film might be in a different network still. The anesthesiologist, the surgeon, the cardiologist, they can all be in different networks. If you're a physician who is trying to take care of this person and you have to deal with trying to find people in all of these specialties who are in your patient's health insurance network, what does that do to the kind of care that you can give that person? What does it do to the care you can give that person if the person has to pay 20% or even 40% of the cost of that care, which is not unheard of? What does that do to the kind of care that you can provide somebody? How are you going to negotiate? What is the person not going to have? If they get all that care, are they going to go home and then lose their house, not have a home anymore because of the cost of the, the, the health care? I've made decisions like this. I've seen, I've had a patient come in to see me in my office who was having a heart attack, a veteran. He had, he, he could be cared for at the veterans hospital for free. He had no other health insurance. The closest hospital was a mere five minutes away. The patient begged me, don't send me to that hospital because I don't have any insurance. I won't be able to, to pay the hospital for the cost of a hospitalization for a heart attack. I sent the patient to the veterans hospital. The patient arrived in the veterans hospital in congestive heart failure, in cardiogenic shock, we call it. So the heart attack was severe. He, his blood pressure had gone down to a dangerous level. The physician in the emergency room there called me up and yelled at me for, for sending this patient transporting this patient in an unsafe condition to a more distant hospital. So the dilemma that I had been left with and that my patient and my patient's family had been left with, should I have sent this patient to the closest hospital, which was medically correct, so that he could have been taken care of and then perhaps lost his house in the process of paying for paying that hospital bill? Or should I have sent him to the hospital that was farther away, where he would be more unstable, but where he could be taken care of, and even if he died, his family would still have a home? I submit that in a civilized, wealthy country, I should not have to make such a decision, nor should my patients, nor should their family. This is a country that can afford to provide everybody with all the health care that they need. That is the kind of health care system that we should have. We spend by far the most money of any healthcare system in the world. For that, as no other advanced country has, we have more than 50 million people with no insurance, and of the people who have insurance, a large number go bankrupt every year, even though they have insurance. 
they go bankrupt because they can't pay their medical bills. The majority of people who go bankrupt from medical bills have insurance when they get sick. If you, are, if you develop cancer and you have insurance, you have a one in five chance of suffering severe financial hardship for that. If you don't, if you're just any cancer patient, you have a one in four chance. But if you have insurance, you still have a one in five chance. So the healthcare system that we should have is a system that, in which every person can get all of the care that we need from the providers of our choice without suffering financial hardship. The healthcare system that we have is a system in which even if you have insurance, you are at risk of going bankrupt if you get sick. We take as, as the basis for the plan that we want to, to provide Medicare. Medicare is a social program. A social program is designed to promote human welfare. A Medicare, a, a social program for the care of the sick is designed to care for the sick and to absorb and spread risk. Very few of us would be able to pay out of pocket for the cost of a hip fracture and a, a heart attack. That's not going to happen to very many people. So what we do is we all put our money into a pot, and out of that pot, our care gets paid for. Well, what you want to do is spread that risk over the largest number of people possible. And that's what Medicare does. It spreads it over the, the whole elderly population. I should say that's what it used to do before Medicare Advantage plans came around. Spread it over the whole population. So everybody pays in, then those who, are gets, who get sick uh, get what they need. And let me add, this doesn't just take care, this doesn't just help the elderly person who's getting sick. What is it like if you, if your parents, your grandparents did not have Medicare and the cost of their illnesses had to fall on their families? How many of our families could provide for all of the care that elderly people need? So it's not just for elderly people, it's for all of us to, to, uh, to spread the risk among all of us. So a social program for the care of the sick spreads the risk to everybody, provides for what people need. Let's contrast that with the system that we have now, which is founded on commercial insurance. So a commercial enterprise, the basis of a commercial enterprise is profit. A commercial enterprise doesn't care whether somebody who, has, who fractures their hip has care or not. That's irrelevant. As some of our friends in, who've been in the health insurance industry say, what they are told is what a health insurance company is about. We are not here to pay claims. We are here to collect premiums. That's what a health insurance company is for. A for-profit company, even a not-for-profit company, they all behave the same in most respects. It's there to collect premiums and not to pay out claims. So how do you do that? You have to shed risk. That means you have to dump sick people. You have to, and you have to protect healthy people from having to pay for the cost of sick people. Well, of course, the problem is all of us get sick at some time or another. Of course, a few of us use no medical care, and then one day we drop dead, and that's it. That's really cheap. But that's a health insurance, a healthcare system is not about having everybody drop dead, die a sudden death so that they don't cost the system anything. <laughs> As I said, uh, the goal of a healthcare system is to promote health, to prevent disease, to cure when possible, to treat when we can, and to provide comfort for everybody. <coughs> to do that, you have to spread risk among everybody. Can we do that? Yes, I believe that not only can we do it, but eventually we will. We know that that is going to be a long, hard struggle because the people who are opposed to that, the health insurance and pharmaceutical industries, have enormous amounts of wealth and power. All of our premiums that they take in, all of the, the, and then out of that, that they, they use those premiums to pay lobbyists, to go to Congress, state, national, everything. They pay those, take those premiums, use them to pay their CEOs huge amounts of money, millions yeah. of dollars. They take that money and use it to put into the, the uh, campaigns of uh, legislators who are going to do what they want. Yes, that's what we're up against. And nonetheless, we are going to fight that because we have no choice if we want to live in a civilized country with a civilized health care system. So I'm going to stop and after Mr. After Will Cox, I'll come back. Ha, ha, ha.
And young people have to look at this very stuff. Young people don't take decisions when they go vote anyway. They, they vote, if they vote at all, they're not voting in their own best interest. I always tell young people and my grandkids, you know, you got to think about this more seriously when you go vote. You have to vote in your own best interest. Because politicians are looking for their own interest. That's what they, they're looking to stay in office. If they can fool us and lie to us to stay in office, that's exactly what they're going to do. So we have to look at, we'll look out for our own best interest and say, okay, what it is going to be in our own best interest for our children and our grandchildren so that they, they can have a quality of life that at least equal to ours or better. That's the way I look at it. Now, now let's look at one other point I want to make before, before I sit down. We also have a situation, I want to talk a little bit about Medicaid. Okay, you got Medicaid, you got Medicaid. Medicaid, of course, is our state program. <clears throat> now, uh, under Obamacare, the state is going to be required to take on more people under Medicaid. Under Medicaid, the state is going to be required to do that. Now, we already got a state here in Illinois that's hemorrhaging. Okay, even this last budget that the government came out with, they're going to have a 500 billion, a 516 million dollar deficit at the end of this fiscal year. So it's still, it's still running in the red. He doesn't have a better, you know, he, 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 even, I don't care what he tells us, okay, when you get that analyzed the figures, you get independent groups to analyze the figures, they can say, okay, this budget's going to still be in the red. Okay, so if we got a problem with the state having have to take on more people under Obamacare that we can't afford to do. So we got, so, so, what, that's one of the reasons why my whole position is that it has to be repealed, because it cannot be sustained financially. The plan just cannot be sustained for that. And one other thing we need to understand about Obamacare. Now, businesses are required, if their program does not repeal, businesses under, if you get uh, more than 50, uh, more than, uh, more than 50 people, you know, more than 50 people in, in, in employees, then you have to be, ob you obligated to provide health care for them. You're mandated to provide health care for them. If you're under 50 people, you're not mandated mandate to provide health care for So I come and say, why should I go over 50 people then? Why should I continue to hire 50 people I'm mandated to provide health care for? All that's going to do is up my expenses and cut back on my profits if I do that. So you got a lot of business say, okay, well, wait, 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 I'm not going to even consider hiring any extra people then. So now we got an apartment in Illinois where now 10%. We got businesses leaving Illinois because the tax, because the tax rates are too high. You got Caterpillar right now, instead of, instead of locating in Illinois, they decided to locate the plant in Georgia. And 1,700 people in Georgia because they don't want to deal with the tax environment in Illinois. And then, so you, you look at that, you couple that and say, okay, now, they, they, they want to go to a, a right to work state because they don't want to do a deal with the, the union issues and the tax environment. Uh. And then we got another issue where they got to deal with what. What is, what is going to be my cost for health care? They don't even know. The, the, the business don't even know that because it's all up in hand. So, 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 so consequently, it, 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 the, the hiring is depressed. The hiring of people is depressed. We've got, we got a problem right now with unemployment. Because not only, not only with Obamacare looming over the businesses, <coughs> and they don't know what, what's going to happen next month or uh, ten, uh, five, ten, <coughs> 12 months from now, I don't know what's going to happen. And so, so look, I'm going to, you know, it's going to have to be repealed so that we can, we can get our economy back on track and get businesses that, that you know, consider, you know, get back on track and consider hiring people again. The 10 percent unemployment is, is totally unacceptable in Illinois and in, in this country. We've had, we've had uh, unemployment at, at over, over 8 percent. I think right now, statistically, it says 8.6%, but that's not even realistic, okay? Because so many people just don't even look for work anymore. And so the point is, is that these are depression level unemployment statistics in certain areas of this country. Okay, so, so consequently, we're going to have to make some decisions about that, we're going to have to be repealed so that our country economically can get back on track, and that, and that our Medicare and our Social Security system can be stopped and saved for the future. 
Okay, I'm going to step pause right now. I think the next step we're going to have questions and answers. I think is that what it is? Yeah. There will be a, she'll be, have the last word. She'll get her 15 minutes and then we'll go into questions and answers. I'm going to go call my senator and tell him what to do. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, just, um, Will and I agree with one thing, which is that employers should not have any access. I think we agree. Employers should not have to bother about health insurance. I agree on that. So the system that we have, there would be a tax on employers. Everybody would pay in according to their income. Uh, the more you have, the more you pay, the less you have, the less you pay. All of this goes into one pot, and out of that you pay for all of the health care that everybody needs. And the reason we can do that and afford to do it, and we can do it for less money than we're spending now on health care, is because our current uh, health care system has such a huge administrative expenses. So our, the health care cost for the whole country is now something like $2.8 trillion, I believe is the last figure. Of that, at least 30% is administrative. If we just cut, cut that administrative cost in half, we have enough money yeah. to provide for all of the health care that everybody needs. So we don't have to spend any more money. We have the money there. We just have to use it wisely. And the first thing that you do is for efficiency is to get rid of administrative excess. Um, let's see. To address a couple of questions that have come up, um, the idea of medical tourism. Okay, this uh, wealthy woman from uh, England comes over to the United States to get her health care. At the University of Chicago, according to some of the nurses who work there, uh, they have beds, a certain number of beds set aside for VIP tourists, people who are coming from foreign countries to the University of Chicago for very high-tech, specialized care. At the same time that they're doing that, the emergency room is on ambulance bypass. 50% of the time, I'm from Mitchell or so. Correct. The, uh, the emergency room, we cannot take the, uh, the emergency room is on an ambulance bypass because there are no beds for ordinary people in that hospital. There are no more beds in the emergency room. So those are the priorities that they have. So yes, we can treat VIPs from other countries, but in the meantime, the people who live in the neighborhood are going without medical care. Uh, this is common. The, and it, it, plus, there are people from this country going to other countries. It's actually the United States that has the highest uh, rate of medical tourism. People go to uh, Mexico, to the Philippines, to India for health care because it's less expensive than getting it here. The, the question of competition. Uh, when people tell me competition makes things, uh, makes everything better. You know, oh, yeah. I sometimes don't know what people mean by that. But uh. when it comes to medical uh, Medicare Advantage plans, we do know something about uh, competition. We know that the insurance companies compete to dump sick people and to collect premiums from healthy people who don't cost them anything. So the Medicare Advantage plans compared to regular Medicare, for each patient who goes into a Medicare Advantage plan, on the average, that insurance company gets 113% of the cost of a patient in Medicare, regular Medicare. Plus, the insurance companies skim off the healthiest people. They cherry pick. So they're getting more money for taking care of healthier patients. Now, while the patients are in the Medicare Advantage plan, they, they cost the insurance company less. So the rate of hospitalization for patients within the Medicare Advantage plan is lower than the rate of hospitalization for patients in regular Medicare. But then you see people drop out of Medicare Advantage. And then what happens? The rate of hospitalization for those who have left Medicare Advantage plans is higher than the rate of hospitalization for people in regular Medicare. Why would this be? Because Medicare Advantage plans are set up to penalize sick people, as indeed the financing of our whole health care system is set up. If you get sick, you're in trouble. You're not going to have enough money to pay for, for your health care costs. So in Medicare Advantage plans, so they have, you get, um, you get they, they attract people by offering them um, gym memberships, things like this. Of course, the only people who are going to join to get a gym membership are people who are healthy. So they attract healthy patients. If you've already got cancer and you're getting chemotherapy, you can't go to the gym. Not if you're sick. So those people are left out. And they, they, they require people who get chemotherapy. They're, they have restricted networks so that people who have
have specialized needs, cannot go to the doctors that they want, so then they drop out of the Medicare Advantage program, they go back into regular Medicare, and now they're more expensive. This is what, the, the, the best way to compete is to game the system, to cheat. That's the best way to compete, and that's what they do. Health insurance companies all do that. How can we get the healthy patients into our plan and dump the sick people somewhere else? Some of, the, some of them do this openly, like sending letters to their pregnant patients telling them to go to a different insurance company. This has happened to California. <laughs> this is what they do. I mean, if you, if you're, uh, you can't even imagine the things that insurance companies do. I have a whole list of them. I can't even go into all of them. But, and, um, Will was talking about reserves. Well, this is, a, this is another new wrinkle that insurance companies are doing. They're creating subsidiaries, setting them up in states with low insurance regulations, and they have them, the ownership is different. So you can, they can actually, they found a way to set up insurance subsidiaries that do not maintain adequate reserves. They escape government regulation on that. So they're, they're going to go broke at some point if their claims go up. And this has already happened to friends of mine. They bought insurance and the insurance company went broke and left them with their claims to be. Um, these are companies that are set up to earn a profit. They don't care how they do it. They just do it. Any way that they can get away with it. Um, I think that I might stop there because I, I would like to answer the questions that people have and also listen to your comments. So. First lucky question. Uh, I hear from Jeff Schrock. Yes, ma'am. Um, you just made a statement a minute or so ago to the effect that if you get sick, you don't, you're not going to have enough money to be taken care of. Is that a fair representation? Can you hear me or not? Yeah, more or less. Okay, all right. And, and in your if first... you're very wealthy, of course, you might. But here, you would. All right. Um, and earlier in your first go around this, you made a statement to the effect that this country has enough money to give everyone the health care that they need. Am I correct. remembering that correct? That's correct. Well, I have to ask you, how in the world can you make such a statement responsibly? How can you imagine that that would be so? Well, unless, of course, your de definition of need is so minimum no, that it's true by definition. No, I'm talking about dental care, long-term care, hospice, physician, vision care, hearing, uh, all of that. Yes, we clearly have enough money to do that because the way we know that is our country spends far more per person per year than any other health system in the world, and yet we have worse outcomes. So if we get rid of the administrative excess that we have, this enormous cost of supporting all these different insurance companies and their CEO salaries and their, their claims denial mechanisms, if we just get rid of that, that money can provide us all with, with all the health care that we need. Yes, How clearly. do you know that last statement? I because totally because you know other yeah. countries do it. Yeah. If they can do it, we can do it. Yeah. They have better outcomes, they, they don't have any uninsured people, and they spend far less money. Uh, Butler? Yes. Uh, doctor, if this were a uh, perfect world, and this were a committee of Congress, and you were asked to choose which other country or country has a system closer to what you would like to see made available to the American people? Uh, are there other <laughs> countries that are, are doing it well enough that uh, they could be used as an example? Well, uh, almost every other country, every other industrialized country is doing it better than we are, let's say that. But yes, our, our is very similar to Canada's because we already have a Medicare program. So we would use our Medicare program, but expand it to include every single person in the country from birth to death, have to cover everything under one program. So it will be somewhat similar to Canada, although not exactly the same. Something Brown Emanuel said when he was in Congress. I, I didn't hear that. I I okay. Okay. Uh, 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 President Obama said, said it when he was in the state okay. Senate. He said he'd, he'd go for a single payer system. Of course, when he's needed money from the insurance company, he changed his mind. But, uh, uh, okay. Uh, all right. All right. I have. All right. I have a question for uh, Dr. Shades. Um, you were talking about providing providing everybody with with the health care they need and. Um, now, uh, what I wanted to ask you about is uh, 
What, how do you feel about providing health care for problems that result from people's own choices? Like, for example, a person who, a person who smokes and who then gets uh, emphysema, uh, or, or a person who drinks and then eventually gets cirrhosis of the liver or has to go into rehab or whatnot, or a person or drugs or, or, uh, or eating, eating uh, fattening food, that sort of thing. How do you feel about, I mean, a great deal of, of the health care that people pay for later in life results in choices that they made uh, of themselves, like some of the people here in this room even made. How do you feel about that? <laughs> okay. Well, it's, I wouldn't really go by how I feel about any of those things. I mean, the, the administrative cost of trying to sort out what part of people's health care problems is due to choices that they made and what part is due to something else, I mean, it's just enormous. You know, we can see a sort of example of this in the veteran system, where right now you have eight classes of veterans. And one of the things that, you, that they try to determine is what part of somebody's illness or disability is service related. Well, I mean, that's, that's an enormous administrative burden on the system when you get sick to try to figure out if it's service related or not. It's the same thing with people's choices. What part of your choices is due to your genetic, uh, what genes you have. You know, that has to do with what you eat, probably whether you're attracted to cigarettes or other drugs. And then ad addressing lifestyle choices, that should be done as a public health issue. How do you find effective ways to discourage smoking? How do you find effective ways to encourage uh, exercise and to encourage people to eat healthy diets, to stay out of the sun? Uh, it, it, you know, there are a lot of things that are affected by lifestyle that don't even usually come into the discussion. You know, how much sun exposure do you get? That affects your risk of getting cataracts and your risk of getting skin cancer and so on. How are you going to start all those things out? So you, and that's a, that's an, that just adds administrative costs to the system. So you just ignore that, address those with public health programs, and then whatever people get, you just take care of them. Uh, uh, so the, if, if, if your primary concern is keeping costs down, you could keep the cost of the system down even more by just not, not paying for anything. Well, that's true. You could just let anybody, everybody die when they get sick. Yeah. 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 But, you know, that's, okay. then you yeah. don't really have a health care system. We might as well just continue this. Yeah. 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 Uh, well, there are a lot of different outcomes that can be measured. Um, life, life expectancy, um, maternal mortality rate, uh, infant mortality rate, um, years of... Uh, years of productive life left. <laughs> okay. We are 30 seconds. We are 30 seconds. If you're going to get a chance to talk about it, yes. We are 30 we'll have Karen, seconds. Uh, we'll get the, the next question. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll have oh, Karen address her. Okay. She knows some of the statistics, too, but there are lots of them. Uh, sat patient satisfaction with the health care system. Um, the, which uh, best life um, survival rates are breast, colon, um, childhood leukemia, the cancers. Uh, I mean, there are an enormous number of measures that, that have been done in one place or another. On a very few of them, the United States comes out ahead, but those are very few. And things like um, other measures of the healthcare system, uh, number of physicians for population, number of nurses for population, you know, number of hospital beds, stays in the hospital. The United States is all of those things. So if you, you have to really look hard to find things that we do best at, and for the amount of money we spend, you know, those are insignificant. How else does breast cancer survive? Here. I think what people, uh, and you, you can respond to this, Dr. Sheets. People, people in the United States confuse rescue care with total care. So if you can explain that, we are 32nd in preventive care because of the expense of rescue care. He did bring it up in later treatment, but how would that change if we had better broad care? Would we be able to spend more, more money in preventive care? If you can explain that. Well, I know, I, I'm really hesitant to talk about uh, preventive care and other care in terms of costs because there's no, everybody dies. Since everybody dies, everybody gets sick. Yes. And there's really no reason why a preventive, uh, an illness that can be prevented should be more expensive than an illness that can't be prevented. So if you get rid of all the illnesses that you can prevent, everybody's still going to die. And they might die just as expensively. Because if they, you know, so if you, 
Can we can't right now we can't prevent Alzheimer's disease. Well, it's not cheaper to die of Alzheimer's disease than to die of complications of diabetes on the whole, as far as I know. So you, you can't really talk about prevention in terms of saving money. You, you do prevent care because you want people to be healthy. You want to catch diseases before they get serious. That's the reason you do it. And yes, if there's preventive care that's effective, we should do it. And what we can't prevent, then it should be treated. You, you put all of this together in one system, then you can give people whatever they need. Now you get into some really crazy uh, situations with the, system, the situation that we have now. So there have always been ins insurance companies and their products have always made distinctions between uh, preventive care or uh, early detection, screening, we might have screening, we would call it, and treatment. So if you go in to see your doctor and you have absolutely no symptoms and you're 55 years old and you've never had a colonoscopy, you have nothing wrong with your digestion, then you, you would qualify for a screening colonoscopy. Okay, now under PPACA, that's supposed to be free. What if you tell your doctor that you've been constipated for the last two months? That's no longer a screening colonoscopy. That's not prevention. That's a diagnostic colonoscopy. It's not free any longer. So when you go to the doctor, you be careful not to tell the doctor you've got any symptoms until after the test is done and the results are back and it's been paid for. So then you could tell them that you've had symptoms or her so that you don't have to pay for it. I mean, this is crazy. And that's the situation we're in. I'll tell you oh. all and then Charlie. Could you please explain how Cuba is able to provide the best medical care for a person in the Western Hemisphere and they're an extremely poor country? How is it that they're able to do that? How is it to help as a people? Well, I, I'm not an expert on Cuba, but I can say some things about their health care system. It's, it's fundamentally it's based in primary care and public health. And that's certainly what we advocate. And they do things like they, the doctors see patients in their offices in the morning and then they go out and do home visits. In this country, it's really difficult to, for physicians to do home visits and get paid. That, that's a high area. If you do that under Medicare, that's a place that's targeted for fraud because the, the, the companies that look for fraud will say that you're doing this for the convenience of the patient that's not paid for. You have, you have to do it because it's medically necessary that is paid for. I mean, this is another crazy thing that you get into. But uh, I think there should be a lot more home visits. If a, uh, a pregnant woman should be seen at home by her, her midwife. Once a child is born, the child and the family should be visited at home by the midwife or a nurse. Elderly people should be visited at home by a nurse or a physician. I mean, I think those things would improve the health of our population. And they're not very expensive. In this country, we do get into a lot of very high-tech uh, medicine that's of questionable usefulness. Not that people shouldn't have high-tech medicine when they need it, but it's a questionable usefulness. All right. Some of you may have questions for Will Barnes as well. Uh, Charlie? Yeah, I've got a question for Will. Will, I don't see all these Republicans on C-SPAN like <laughs> Newton, Santorum. They all have this mantra like you do. We've got to get rid of Obamacare. Mm -hmm. But I don't see any details of what they're going to replace it with other than every man for himself. I mean, there are a hundred million people who are uninsured or not insured at all in this country without Obamacare. What are you going to do for this 100 million people? I mean, what should I tell my senator tomorrow? I'm going to call him. Yeah. He works for me, you know. Right. <laughs> yeah. 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 The rule constitution, which I doubt whether it, it would be rule constitution, by uh, being constitutional anyway, I don't think it's going to be. Uh, I think the Supreme Court is going to rule against this. That, that's my opinion. I don't think that the government can make anybody buy something they don't want to buy. I just don't, I just don't think that's going to happen. What about auto insurance? 
what I know is a little different because you know you don't have to grab an automobile. See, what, what, Obama, what Obama said is that because you exist in this country, you got to, you have to buy health care. That's what he's saying. That country exists. I mean, if you're going to buy an automobile, it's a different story. I mean, you don't have to buy an automobile. You don't have to drive. I got a friend who ain't never learned how to drive. You know, so, I mean, some people just don't want to drive, or he's scared to learn how to drive. So that's a whole, whole different category of folks. But he said that everybody, because you exist in this country, you're going to have to buy health insurance. That, that, you know, that's, that's, totally, that's totally unconstitutional. Can you answer his question? I'm sorry. I'm, I'm going to get to his question. Oh, okay. I'm just, you know, I'm, he, he kind of interrupted me a little bit. I was just trying to address what he said. All right, now, everybody, everybody may not even want health insurance in this country. That's the whole point. I don't know. I mean, I've never bought health insurance a policy in my life. I mean, I mean I, 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 I've never been in a hospital in my life. I go to visit people in the hospital, but I've never been in the hospital for me personally. And I never bought health insurance. I mean, there are young people out here who will probably never buy health insurance and never even go into the health insurance system for anything. Why should we make 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 them buy it anyway? That's how many people have no meaning. Why do you say Just a moment, Craig. Sir, you still haven't answered the question as to what you would replace our current system with. Replace the current system? Yeah, what would you I would improve the current system. I would improve the current system. I would replace it. Okay, I would improve it. How? Okay, I'm just going to get into it. Okay, it's a question in the back, but let me let me try to address your question right now. See, one of the one of the ways we improve the system. See, look, for example, do you, do you, let's understand something about the, how, how the system works. The last estimate that is about Medicare is that there was roughly about $48 billion in improper medical payments that went out. $48 billion, okay? Now, one way you improve the system is get the waste fraud and abuse out of the system. That's one way you, and you can redirect that money to, to a more high, actually you can start, in, you can start actually making health care more available to more people once you get the fraud out of the system. You got 40, when, you, when you got $40 billion worth of fraud in the system, that is a real problem. Secondly, there's about roughly about 20, 22.5 billion dollars in fraudulent payments that went out to the Medicare, went out to the, the federal share of Medicaid. But nobody, none of these politicians are talking about getting the fraud out of the system. Now, if you want, you can insure more people. Once you get the fraud out of the system, and then redirect the money to to help the people who, who need health care. But get the fraud out of the system. That's one way you. That's one way you reform the system. That's one way you improve the system. Forty billion dollars is a lot of money. Let's, let's, can we agree on that? Yeah. That's a lot of money that's going to fraudulent practices. Thank you, uh, Karina Shushan. Okay, one question I had because um, I have two, but one of them is: Is contraception um, part of health care? Well, because that's the reason why I asked. My personal opinion, my personal opinion, no, it's not part of healthcare. Contraception. Personal opinion, not part of healthcare. Do you? Yes. Yes. We have a disagreement. And then, okay, Peter. To the doctor, regarding. Obamacare, is it good, bad? Does I anybody would. know what's in it? Uh, well, Obamacare is basically the same thing as Romney care, so in that sense it is a <laughs> bipartisan <laughs> bill in spite of the fact that depending on which, where you are, whether it's at the state or the federal level, the two parties are each going to um, disown it or blame the other party for everything that's wrong. But the thing about it, that, and we call it the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, EPACA, it does not solve, does not solve our health care crisis, and repealing it will not solve the health care crisis anything either. So it it's just, it's a there are some things that are better, and mo mostly it makes things worse for the simple reason that it takes a whole bunch of public and private money and turns it over to the insurance industry and lets them pretty much do what they want with it. But, yeah, look, uh, uh, Bernie Kahani. Can I comment on that real quick? Uh, yeah. yeah um, uh, uh, the, uh, um, Former Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, said that the bill has to be paid. 2,700 page bill. It has to be paid before we know what's in it. We still don't know what's in it. I don't think it, I mean, we're still finding out what's in this bill. A lot of stuff that we're finding out that's in the bill, you know, people are, being, people are getting very 
uh, very sad about what's in this bill. So I mean, I, so we still everything is still being discovered. Okay. So let's let's you know if, if you're going to be you know want Obamacare, you're going to have to be very careful about me to learn about what's in it. Yeah. All right, Bernie. A uh, question for both of you, if I may, regarding both Social Security and Medicare or government provided medical services. Let us take the tell that expenses are in fact going to exceed revenues very soon. What is going to happen? Is the, uh, our services going to cease? Are they going to go on? I mean, where, where's money going to come from? Our services in the season. What's going to happen? Questions okay. directed well, to both of you, please. Under the system that we have now, I think it's going to implode. I don't know exactly what's going to happen, but it's clearly a disaster. So we are proposing a system in which you collect money from taxes. As I said, a progressive tax. The less you have, the less you pay. The more you have, the more you pay. You put all of that money into one pot. You set a budget. Within that budget, different se sectors have to negotiate. So. Hospitals negotiate for what we call global payments. They get a lump sum payment every month to take care of the patients in their neighborhood. Doctors negotiate for their fees. Dentists negotiate for their fees. You have to stay within a budget. The way that you contain costs is by staying within a budget. And the way that you make sure that you get the most for what you're spending is to decrease administrative costs and pay for things that work. I, I, agree, with, I agree with basically what you said. See, what I was saying earlier is that the money needs to be block granted to the states. Once the money is block granted to the states, then it, it can be negotiated. Fees can be negotiated between doctors and hospitals, and so that they can, if you have a budget, then they can stay within that budget, and then and then uh, 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 your people can be served. I think uh, more properly and, and, and if you do it that way. Yeah, Alabama should do a good job. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, hear, I hear the comment. What the, what the comment? Alabama should do a good job. <laughs> who's, who's next? Mike? No. Now, I got a question for both of you. Why should the government even be involved in this? Why didn't the government just say, like Charlie said, every man for himself or whatever. Whatever the people do is whatever the people do, but the government ain't paying for your medical bills. Okay, well, we could do that, but then there are lots of things that we, we, don't, we don't have a, health, a modern health care system if we do that. We can go back to the time when there were no, you couldn't get a joint replacement. If you broke your hip, then you walked on the kind of hip that you had left, or you didn't, or you died. That's not um, true. Why not? Anybody that wants a hip replacement can go to anybody that does hip replacements and say, Doctor, I want a hip replacement. <laughs> Well, the government isn't saying you can't have a hip replacement. The government is saying we ain't paying for your hip uh, replacement. So the, the government can't tell you not to have it, but to have a hip replacement, I went through this with the talking about the broken hip, you, you can't, it's more than just a doctor. You have to pay for the, for the artificial hip. Okay, you have to pay, pay the for hospital. all. You have, so almost nobody can afford to do that. Then nobody will get hip replacement. Okay, That's so we could go back to that kind of system, healthcare system. So we don't have, we give up having a modern healthcare system and we just. Okay, we so we a, give up having a modern. What's the problem with that? All right. Well, I, people you know, die. People, on, yeah, people yeah. die. Did you ever hear that? No healthcare. Lots of Yes, I myself have had, uh, I've had a fortunately very benign ovarian tumor, but it was a uh, cancer. I mean, it's a very benign <coughs> stage of cancer. I would have, if I hadn't been able to get surgery for that, you know, I would have died at the age of, I don't know, 55 or so. I mean, I'm glad I'm still alive. And I would like for people around me to be able to live longer too. So I don't want us all to just die of diseases that we do have the technological capacity to treat, provided that we pool the financial risk. Is everybody uh, supposed to live to be four or five hundred years old? Uh, you had one previously. Right. Oh, okay, Ellen Haro. No, he wants to have a uh, friend. Excuse no, me. He wants a brief cover. All right. Yeah. Uh, so my question is for Wilbur. Actually, this is. Oh, no, 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 he wants to have a brief cover. I just had a brief cover. No one even said it was very nice. My grandmother was born in 1887. She died in 1996, at 79 years old. She died before there was any Medicaid. Now, how does she live? That's the average lifespan, you know, you know, people that's expected to live right now. 
She lived in that city. How did she happen to do that? She practiced houses in her own way. She had a garden at the back. I mean, this, we, I ain't talking about what this can be done now. We, because we can't all have gardens in the back, but we got our own fresh vegetables and everything. But she was talking about the importance of eating properly. She had a garden in the back. Every vegetable that you can think of, she had it in this garden. And, if, and when she got ready to eat, she'd go out there and pick some fresh vegetables. So every meal she had was some fresh vegetables in this meal. She, even, she never even had a regular diet that we knew about, but she, but she died of natural causes. So, so one of the things that we have to say is that you do have to practice, and I think she agree with me on this, Dr. agree with me on this, you have to do have to practice good health principles. And if you do have, and see, I, I, I have a Medicare Advantage plan. I kind of disagree with this Medicare Advantage plan position that you take. See, Medicare Advantage plan, you can, you can, only, only person that refused on the Medicare Advantage plan is people who, 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 who have in stage renal disease. Right? And this, on radio, on radio dialysis. Everybody else has to be accepted. You talk about mandates, they have to be accepted into the Medicare Advantage plan if they apply for it. And if you qualify for it. Okay? And, then, and then, you know, you have some additional benefits that you, vision and, and dental, and, and I take advantage of all of this stuff. I'm in the Medicare, Medicare Advantage plan myself. I go to the, to the uh, YMCA for, and, and work out in the gym. So, I mean, this stuff, I mean, if you can do things to stay healthy in the Medicare Advantage plan, to keep from going in the hospital, you should. And you should get involved in it. Okay, my, that's actually my question. So, I, I want to go off of Obamacare to, uh, back to, you were talking about Social Security, and you said that uh, and you were talking about the state of finances, and you said that you didn't think that it was acceptable that your grandchildren would have to have a worse, uh, worse life because of the, the, the financial situation is all falling apart. And I want to know, was it acceptable to you when we were in Iraq? Was it accept is it acceptable that 50% of our budget is, is going and, and goes to military, not only the armament, but the, the kinds of things that have to be paid for, uh, continual pay for, for people who, who, who uh, are hurt in yeah, wars yeah. and things like that. Yeah, let me respond to that. Uh, in my reading of the Constitution, I don't see anything in the Constitution that said that, we, that tax, taxpayers' money, our money, to be paid for anything that even resembles Medicare, for example. It's not true. The welfare of the people is mentioned. Right. Well, that, that's subject to interpretation. But it does say that we need to provide for the defense of this country. It does say that very clearly. And so I support the defense budget 100%. I think we should have a defense that's second to nobody in this world. Okay? Everybody in this world should understand that our defense, if you mess with this country, you're going to get, you're going to get retaliated upon. And, it, and, and you're going to get, and, you, and it's going to be a situation where you're going to totally regret. I, I have no problem with the defense budget being what it is. I will pay for the defense budget and admit it. I think that this country should be the strongest military in the world. That's my position. Are you telling me that you don't think that there's any relationship with, between the fact that there, there isn't enough money for social services in this country now and the fact that we're spending so much on, on military budget? I, I've got a problem with the waste that, how money is wasted in this country. I mean, you got Solyndra and all these other kind of dumb projects that, that wasting millions and millions of dollars for absolutely nothing. Okay? You know, that's, I got a problem with how this money is wasted. I have no money to tell you. You got waste in almost every agency of government. You can go to every agency what? of government and pull out waste, okay? And that's what these politicians are doing. Bringing the waste, bringing the waste out of the government. But in terms of defense, I have no problem with the defense budget. I have two questions. First of all, to, to those folks who say that their grandmother had fresh vegetables, did their grandmother also have fresh killed meats too? Uh, yeah. My grandmother had chickens running around under the house, so that was fresh meat. Secondly, uh, I'd like to know what your position is on affirmative action. On affirmative action? Yes. I, I don't see what's necessary. That's my position on it. I'd like for equal opportunity for everybody. That's, that's it. That's where I look at uh, I know of other respected, intelligent, uh, conservative people who lied to us about 
the so-called fraud that you referred to, uh, exaggerated amounts of fraud. Where did you get your data? About $48 billion in fraud. So the, the, the CMS, the Center for Medicare, uh, what is it, Center for Center Medicare, Medicare Service. What's that? So that's, that's the center that oversees all, all your Medicare services, period. You just, in fact, I mean, it's easy to services. discover this information. I mean, you, you got, you got uh, uh, Senator Coburn who dug this stuff out. You got the, the uh, uh, Citizens for Government Waste. I mean, they've already dug this information out of the public, the, the public documents. The ones that are available for you to go look at. Then, to follow that up, were, 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 was that fraud perpetrated by patients or by medical providers? No, medical providers. No, medical providers, okay. providers primarily. You. The medical providers. The doctors. Oh, yeah, that's who, that's who perpetuates the fraud. You got doctors who have been identified and acted jail for fraud. All right, I was calling Ellen Rowe. There you go. Okay, um, Ellen, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I have two questions. Um, first, for you, one is you keep on talking about getting waste and fraud out of the system. How do you? Plan, uh, plan on doing that. I mean, uh, right now, are you saying they're not trying to do that at all? They're not. Nobody's trying to get it out of the system. I, I don't see any real evidence of. Any what What is the method you have to get it out of the system? I mean, what are your methods that are superior to the ones that are being used now? No, I mean you you, you have the you have the entities in place already, but they're just not working. It appears to me. I mean, you've got investigative units in government that they, they ought to be able to identify when doctors do their billing in a fraudulent way, or when they're when they're, when they're billing for patients that don't exist, or when they're billing for services that are unnecessary, or duplication of services, and all this kind of stuff. I mean, there's a way that this can be identified right now. But the point is, are they identifying it? It can be done. If you if they can identify the waste, they know that it's a waste, then they, they can actually prevent it from happening. But it takes a political will on the part of our government to do it. But what what is your evidence that, that you what is your evidence that you know of a better way of them doing it? Are you are they just not sending the inspectors out? Are they sleeping on the job because they have civil service protection? I mean, what is it? I mean, you don't seem to have any idea specifically of, I mean, I'm not saying that there isn't a lot of fraud going on, but I, I don't hear anything from you about how, how it could actually be done differently. Or what You're just saying it can be done differently, but that's, you know, that, those are words that don't really have any specific. You've got to hire more federal employees. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Can I speak a little bit about the front? <laughs> <laughs> there, there are front texts. Uh, the front texts are there's a lot of front detection um, stuff that goes on in in um, private insurance companies and in um, Medicare and Medicaid. And so, some of it is well directed and some of it isn't. Um, I myself have had the experience of having uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield accuse us of fraudulent billing when in fact the, the patient that we were billing for had two Blue Cross Blue Shield policies uh, identical, one paid for by his employer, one paid for by himself. I would consider that a fraud on the part of the insurance company and they demanded that we pay everything back under the, insur the, the policy we had billed under, and then they would allow us to resubmit the bills under the other insurance policy, and then they'd consider uh, paying those. My, my husband, who is my business manager, tried calling the insurance company and telling them that they were committing fraud and they wanted this uh, investigated. We wanted this investigated, and they refused to investigate it. Uh, anyway, but that's just the kind of thing insurance companies do. That wasn't the only time I got... Uh, had money demanded back. Medicare does have an extensive uh, fraud uh, prevention program. Because the, of the, the very uh, the fragmentation of billing and the fact that not everything is, that people need is paid for under their insurance plans, some of what Medicare would call fraud is doctors and social workers and other people finding ways to circumvent the system in order to give people things that they need. And almost every, I know a lot of people have done this, both under Medicare and under uh, private insurance, giving, using a wrong diagnosis in order to get a patient a medication that an insurance company will pay for if it's for one diagnosis, but they won't pay for it for, if it's for something else. Um, most of us consider this, uh, although legally 
risky and we try to we find ways to avoid the legal risk to be a, to consider it morally justifiable because the patient needs it and we consider the patient's need greater than the insurance company's need to keep that money. When it comes to Medicare, because this is a public program, so Medicare is not running a program for profit. People, I think, have a different standard and many people would or some people would say that they will do something that Medicare would consider fraudulent if they, if it's going to save money, Medicare money in the long term by getting the patient a service in the short term, that they would consider that justified. So there's been a lot of consideration of the ethics of this. Now that being said, I would say that the, the greatest source of Medicare fraud is for profit hospitals, home health agencies, hospices, dialysis centers. It's, it, again, these are for-profit entities. Their legal obligation is to their, to their shareholders to maximize shareholder value. And if that means defrauding Medicare and then getting fined, but getting fined less than what you defrauded, then that's part of your business model. And they do that. So that's the biggest source of fraud. Most regular physicians don't have the capacity to engage in fraud like that. I'm not saying nobody does it at all, and there have been some, some outstanding examples of people doing this, but most of us don't even have the capacity to do that. So it's a business model of for-profit entities. And the, what we say under a single-payer system is that no entity that provides care could be investor-owned for profit. So you would get rid of that business model. All right. Let's see. Uh, Pat Butler. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. You uh, had said uh, about 10 minutes ago that uh, you were in favor of a strong national defense, as are many of us. However, where do you draw the line between a strong, responsible national defense and the type of adventurism we have seen all too often over the past uh, 40 years, uh, where we've gone off into countries where none of our business that were no threat to us, that we had, frankly, no business being there. We left lots of American soldiers buried there. We spent billions of dollars there. Is that part of your model for a responsible defense? Or uh, do you, for example, have some major problems in the so-called Iraqi nation building delusion? Good question, man. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I think, have been in the service myself, having served in the Army, I think that one of the things that um, you, 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 you look at is being able to be strong enough where countries don't want to challenge you. That's one of the things. So you'd have to, you have to be a strong enough country where if you're strong enough, then that keeps you out of war. You know, if you got your, if nobody wants to challenge a country, they know that they're going to get destroyed if they do. I mean, so that's one of the things that I think that we think about when we talk about defense. Now, your, to your question, what is the, you know, the whole adventurism question? You know, see, here's the problem. Our Congress is, is, is the entity that's, that's supposed to declare war. These are the people that represent us. The well, Congress has not declared war uh, since uh, Pearl Harbor. That's where the problem is. The, the system is broken down. We have presidents that engage in these adventuristic uh, going get into involved in these adventurisms without the Congress approval. I mean, that's where the problem comes into play. Congress ought to exercise more power, not let the president do these kinds of things. I mean, that's the way I look at it. Do you agree with me on that? I agree with you on that point. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, Tim Bolger and then uh, Richie and then Janet Miller. Um, Janet you, you Walmart does a pretty good job of keeping prices low and keeping and delivering food and basic services to almost all the country. Why couldn't we let them engage in the healthcare business by opening up things like in-store clinics and letting them letting them do primary yeah. care? I think they're trying to. Walgreens, Walgreens have done it. I mean, Walgreens had clinics. I mean, in my neighborhood, Walgreens would Walgreens Yeah, but they still can't employ a doctor. <coughs> they got nurses, I guess. It's more expensive to employ a doctor. I mean, they, they you know, huh? Yeah, I mean, why not let, let, we had the same trouble with branch banking a few years ago. Now we are everywhere. 
Why can't we just let the same thing happen in the medical system? Right. And I address this to both to both people. Right. The banks provide benefits. Is it banking? <laughs> <laughs> our other gal responding too to the same thing. This is fragmentation of care. Walmart and Walgreens skim off, skim off care that's really easy. And then all the complicated care gets left for the rest of the healthcare system. And you have uh, physicians setting up uh, practices and even a few physicians setting up their own hospitals. They take the care that is easy and profitable that they get paid for and the care that is difficult to deliver and that's not profitable gets left to the rest of the system. So, as a follow-up, follow would you consider it a good public health benefit if some of our health care dollars went into the ailing Cubs to win the World Series? Uh, I'm not a sports fan. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, my question is for Mr. Barnes. Uh, all right, Mr. Barnes, um, you said early on in your lecture that the only time a politician is applying is when his lips aren't moving. Now, a little bit later, during the question and answer session, um, you cited uh, Republican Senator Tom Coburn of Oklahoma as, as a reliable source of information. Now, don't you think that him being a politician, that since he was talking, he must have been lying? That's a good question. Or, uh, see, see, when, I, when, I used to, when I used to teach, I used to always tell my students, you don't have to believe everything. You can still get an A in my class. You don't have to believe everything I'm telling you. But you better back it up with your facts. So that means that means if, if you read what Mr. Coleman is saying, he better have, he better, he, he, he better have some facts to back his, his positions up. But you look at his facts and say, is his facts verified? Can you verify the information by looking at his facts? Is his facts legitimate? That's what you look at. And what if he said, I mean, politicians can tell you anything. It's like if I'm if I'm lecturing to you, I can tell you anything. But then I would be able to back up what I'm saying. That's that's my whole point. Okay, um, this question is for Ann Sheets. Uh, uh, not for you though. Rob, 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 Rob. 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 The people that I least like to be able to get access to my health information can still do it. And by that I mean uh, pharmaceutical companies, you know, drug reps, uh, those kind of people. I, I think it's uh, perhaps well-intentioned, but it prevents people who don't want my health information anyway from getting it. and allows people who are going to use it for commercial purposes to get it anyway. All right. And then
Now, uh, in terms of um, bioterrorism, is that the issue? That we're not talking about people talking real biodefense. We're talking the CIA, the Center for Disease Control are saying without an adequate biodefense, we can't defend our country. How do we defend our country if we don't have a public health system, if we don't have a system of defending it? I just say we shouldn't have a public health system. You're saying we need an adequate defense. Yeah. I mean, public health system is important, right? Well, who's going to fund that, sir? The who's going to fund the public health system? It's only 5% of the current budget. Under for-profit systems, there's no interest in that. There'd be a lot more interest in that if we had a system that was 20% interest. I think we can find, do you think we can eliminate some of this waste and find the money to fund that? You're talking about the pastors. I think that's essential enough to eliminate some of this money from this waste and fund what you're talking about. One way that they've uh, shown to, to, to cure the problems with public schools is to give vouchers to, to parents so they can send their kids to other schools. That created that uh, uh, competition in the system made the public schools get better because they lose their students. Do you think we can have a system where maybe Medicare patients could get vouchers that they each spend where they wanted to and that any anything they didn't spend they maybe would get to keep or something like that as a way of um, introducing competition in the system and maybe getting them to uh, to uh, you know, take preventive measures or maybe quit smoking or quit drinking or whatever or lose some weight and uh, uh, the economics in the center. Do you think it's something yeah, like I that? Yeah, I think so. I think, I think, uh, that's, 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 I think that's an interesting idea. Let's say that, let's say that, uh, your employer, instead of providing you health care, okay, we're going to give you $2,500 per year to buy your own health care. Now, it's up to you to spend buying health care for that $2,500 or less. So you may find one that's less than $2,500, and then you can keep the rest of it. Or you may you may decide, well, I'll just use the money to just to just do preventive health care. I mean, uh, do preventive health care activity. Go, you know, go back their membership or whatever. Do things to keep myself in good shape and just pocket the money. I mean, that, see, that you get options when you know when, when people give you options, then you can you can make those kinds of choices. And I think that the school choice is something that I hundred percent represent. I mean, hundred percent support because I think parents ought to have the choice to get their kids out of a bad public school and put them in a good school. They ought to have that choice. It's, it's their tax money that's being spent anyway. So they ought to be able to take their own tax money and choose the school that they want their children to go to. They do it in Wisconsin, they do it in Indiana, they do it in Ohio. I don't know about uh, Iowa, but it's a surrounding states. They, already, they don't do it in Michigan yet, but I think they're moving in that direction. But I think the more choice you can give people in terms of Medicare and educating their children, I think it's better off all of us come here, especially the parents and to those of us who have to, to buy health care. That's where I look at. Okay. Oh, yeah. Rhonda Perrin, uh, <laughs> Bernie Kahani, uh, Jeff Schrammack, and then Mike Bowie. Okay, this it, oh, that's right. But, uh, you're too close to me here. Uh, 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 Janet, uh, okay, this question is for Ann Sheets. Okay, so I, I want to go back to the example that you gave about this veteran who you had to send to a two to a hospital that was too far for a really efficacious treatment. It, my understanding of the way the healthcare system works is that when you have a patient and you have to transfer the patient, you call the health insurance company, you ask for approval. Why couldn't you do that? Was there not enough time? You had enough time for him to beg you not to, not to send him to that hospital. What, what's, what's going on? Well, he, he didn't have any insurance. The only coverage he had was in a veteran hospital. But why couldn't you call the veterans hospital and have them... They, they won't pay for a patient to be treated in, outside of a veteran hospital. Period. 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 Right. Because other Period. health insurance companies will give you approval if it's an emergency situation. That's not so the way the VA they, works. They might. they might or they might not. They decide whether they're going to give you approval or not. And if they give you approval, that does not mean that they have to pay. They can still de decline to pay. Right. In fact, they do it pretty often. Yeah. This is the, the, the VA does this? Oh. The oh. Well, oh. If, you're, if you're a veteran, there are, yeah. there are lots of categories of veterans, and what category you're in depends on determines what services you can get covered for. But if you are a veteran, 
who has no other insurance and you qualify to be cared for at the VA, the veterans system is not going to pay for you to go somewhere else. You have to go to a veterans hospital or a veterans system. Even in a life or death situation? Yes. Oh my gosh. Okay. <laughs> this is a follow up on uh, Bob Matter's question. Well, if I may. Let's say you're, you have a $2,500 a year voucher and uh, uh, something happens to you where you have to spend a night in the hospital and that $2,500 is gone in an hour and you have about $10,000 in it to do. Uh, how would you handle a situation like this? Yeah. Yes, please. Uh, would you repeat your question, please? Okay, this is a follow-up on Bob Matter's question. Let's say you have vouchers. And uh, let's say, hypothetically, the voucher's value is $2,500. And let's say something happens where you have to stay in the hospital overnight, and that $2,500 is gone in the wink of an eye, and you still have other bills you have to pay. How would you deal with something? Like that? No, $2,500 so voucher is to, is to pay the premium. <laughs> What if you've already got your preventative care? I'm sorry, what? There's only so many things you're going to be able to buy for $2,500. You can buy a premium, you can buy yeah, eye care, you can buy dental care. There's only so far that's going to go. What happens when your potential expenses, your actual expenses, vastly exceed? But that voucher is going to be. Well, but look, depending on your age. For the premium, you get half the total cost of medical expenses. Yeah, I mean, I mean, depending on your age, you might get a hospitalization plan for maybe a couple hundred, you know, maybe hundred fifty dollars a month, depending on your age. I mean, you know, twenty five hundred dollars certainly going to cover that. See, we're talking about paying a premium with twenty five hundred dollars voucher. That's what we're talking about. Wait, I no, think he's... No, Charles, you're out of order. I'm out of answer his question. question. No, I'm out of answer his question. It's called a fee-for-service type program. Yeah, I'm sorry, but you're not... We're sorry what? It means you get a certain amount per illness. Yeah, you are not a mother. The doctor voucher is to pay the premium for the for your medical well, plan. That's what the voucher is. Really that, I mean, it was just in terms of what he was saying. I mean, that's why I was responding to earlier. The voucher is simply to pay the premium for your medical plan. That's all it is. So you get a medical plan for $2,500 a year, then that's what you have. Then so you have an actual medical plan to pay for your medical expenses. All right, Foley. Miller. Miller. She has a lot of For Dr. Sheets or for Mr. Barnes, either one, but who's going to pay in the money to this government well when the government's paying for all our medical bills? Who's going to be the ones that's putting the money into that fund? All of us. You. That's hey. wrong. You're absolutely wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Is a one-year-old baby going to have to go get a job to kick in money to the fund? <laughs> You're We're absolutely wrong when you say that. I said it All of us. All right. Right now, General Electric makes five billion dollars in profit. And they don't pay any income tax. When you say all of us, you're wrong. There's 501c3s. There's 501c3s that don't have to pay tax. They're tax exempt. Sir, I'm when you say all of us, you're wrong. I'm talking about what we're working for. I said it's not going to be easy, and it's not. It's going to be a long. It's going to be a very hard, very long struggle. That is what we are working for. Does your plan cover
No one of us is going to be able to do this, and there's not a simple way to do it. We are all, all going to have to work together to find the way to it, and it's going to be long and hard, and many people are going to die and suffer in the meantime because we don't have this, and that's the way like this. We still have to struggle together. Okay. Hey, Ellen has a question. Yeah, there are two uh, people who yeah, haven't had a too. question, Dan and okay. Marcella. Uh, and I thought you were next. Ben and then Marcel. Okay. Okay. This is for Mr. Barnes. Uh, I know that my health insurance at work costs ten thousand dollars a year. So what am I going to do with two thousand dollars? It's crap. Well, I think you got a you got a great employer. That sounds like to me. You got to get a new employer. You got a, you got a great employer. You pay ten thousand dollars a year for your health care. Yeah, that's right. It's in the plan. There's thirty people in the there's more than thirty people in the plan. Ten thousand dollars per person. Per person. No, it's a family plan. Oh. Two people. Ten thousand dollars for the employees. Pretty good. A year. Pretty good. So what do you want to question? Well, why, you're only giving two thousand five hundred dollars. I'm not giving anything. I mean, you know, somebody brought this figure out. I'm just saying that if 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 you were maybe maybe some some companies would allocate ten thousand dollars and let you decide how you want to use it. That's what we're talking about. You have a choice in terms of how you want to use X amount of dollars that's allocated to you by health care, giving the choice to you rather than rather than saying that this is a company. Here, that, that you have to use and that this money has to be spent with this particular company. What he's suggesting, what I'm talking about, is that the company allows you to make the decision how you want to spend that $10,000. That's what we're talking about. And the money you got left, you can put it in your pocket. How about that? Okay. Sounds pretty good, right? Okay. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, so you, you were donated to my charity. You donated to my charity. I'll take it. Okay. Right. Marcella so, uh, has the last question. Uh, my question is, you know, we're talking about the plans, the money, and how we spend the money. And my question is, how do the doctors feel about this? Because people don't go into the medical field just to make money. I think you have to have a certain amount of wait, 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 you have to have a certain amount of compassion to be a doctor, to go to school for twelve years. Do the doctors have an idea what they want to do? Do they have a plan? Do, if they said to people, everybody should think about this plan, that, I mean, do they have a plan? Well, yes, the plan I'm talking about is a physician's plan. The organization is Physicians for a National Health Care Plan. And there are some doctors who go into medicine for money, but no, the majority of us go into medicine because we want to help people. I retired from the practice of medicine to work full-time as a volunteer on single-payer health care because I saw that I could not take care of my patients as a physician and I needed to do something different. I did that because I care passionately about taking care of people, and so do the vast majority of physicians. Physicians for a National Health Program is a growing organization, although not huge. We have more than 18,000 members. And uh, you can like polls or not, but when polls have been done of physicians asking them if they would want this kind of physician, uh, kind of system, that about 60% of physicians say yes, they would. This is what they want to see. Very good. Thank you. Well, it's 10 o'clock, a little after 10, and I think a number of you have remarks to make to the rest of us, uh, questions to raise, whatever. Uh, you will have ample opportunity in our uh, rebuttal period. How many of you have such remarks to make? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 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 so uh, I'll run the I'll watch the clock, Brom. Thank you, Jim Bolger, who will watch the clock. Uh, At four okay. minutes we will cut you off. Okay. We know and this doctor Hubert, she goes 
Over here. Lunch. Uh, oh, here she is. And uh, is this a doctor over here too, UNMD? I, I'm a family nurse practitioner. Family nurse practitioner. Okay. Uh, any other health professionals here? <laughs> Your nurse. Well, yeah, nurse practitioner. Okay. An MD. MD. Okay. Uh, it's it's no secret that the medical uh, mores out there. It's like the Titanic. It's on a 45 degree angle, and they're rearranging the deck chairs. And it started back in 1975 when the insurance companies allowed doctors to steal. I know for a fact, because I've seen these records, that a doctor can run a $5 test on urine and then bill an insurance company for up to $2,000 for that $5 test. Oh yes, that was when uh, the, all, everybody, I was working at that time, I, w I had full coverage, dental, everything. There was, the, the insurance companies were flush with money. They, they were paying anything, okay? And they did. So these doctors were stealing out there. If you go back to 1975 and check out the memberships of most of the country clubs around the country, you'd see that they were doctors. They were done about noon, 1.30, and then they turned it over to their nurses and so on. And, and they were they were busier now. Okay, you would get maybe five minutes with your doctor. Okay, so they've been stealing since 1975. Then your PMOs came out and so on, and they started looking at this thing, and they saw this spike of expenses at the insurance companies. It was a nightmare. So what did they do? Now because they were payers for these MDs, they had the right to walk in there with a nine millimeter handcuffs and a badge and say, doctor, I want to see your records, because we are paying you uh, for the services that you're given uh, through our insurance company. And they had to open their records up, and here they were, the $5 bill for the, ins the, for the urine and the $2,000 check from the insurance company. They locked the handcuffs on these doctors and called them off. Some other ways to do this. <coughs> this doctor that they just knocked off in Burr Ridge that stole $20 million dollars from the Medicare, Medicaid, and, and a hospital insurance system. He had $6 million in uncashed checks. He had an $8 million house, okay? They, they, they bolted the thing up, took it all back. The guy never went to the hospital. His nurses and his staff were saying that he came in and performed these um, operations and, and visits to these, these uh, patients when he never came in there, okay? $20 million worth of fraud. This guy's about uh, about 60% off on the fraud. What would you say, four, four billion? 48. 48 billion, okay. It's probably more like 400 or 500 billion dollars worth of fraud. Okay? Now what is the answer? I'll tell you. There's a thing called the blue zones, yeah, the blue box, okay. The blue zones out there have people that live to be 125, 150 years old, men are fathering children in their 90s, women are in their 60s having babies, okay? These are very healthy populations. Could Mr. Obama or uh, Hillary Clinton get a uh, um, delegation from these blue zones, bring them in here, and this is what I, I am about. I'm a PMD, a doctor of preventive medicine, okay? And query them as to why these people are living so long and so healthy and then start that out and your time That's where is people up live. Is and there's one in marine county in california there's people that are 100 time years up. old driving your cars time is up. and so on yes yes your time is up your time is up thank you see you next week your time is up Thank you. I'm very happy with the microphone is still working. Um, first of all, Brother Barnes and his grandmother, who never utilized professional health care, should not be making judgments, and they're not qualified to make judgments on those who actually need professional health care, just as Mitt Romney cannot make judgments regarding the welfare of working people. Second, the national health care system in Europe 
was not a grant by the, the government or the employers or the king uh, out of the goodness of their heart. It was demanded by the Labour Party, uh, first in England and then later in the rest of Europe. The, the, the working people actually took over the governments of those countries and demanded the free national health care and they, it persists to this day despite the efforts of Margaret Thatcher and Cameron and others uh, to derail it. Um, number three, Brother Barnes talked about the sad state of Illinois' uh, budget and how uh, we're broke, we can't afford to pay for Medicare. We can trace this back to the uh, Illinois Constitutional Convention in 1970 when the delegates to that convention passed a flat income tax rather than a progressive income tax. And from that time, the budget of the state of Illinois has been in decline. And the state of Illinois, for example, has never fully funded the pension of state employees and probably never will. Thank you. I'm going to be up front with uh, Mr. Will Barnes. Uh, the only talk that I have heard in this place that was more silly than the one that we hear tonight was when this guy said that mosquitoes have soul. <laughs> he was a couple of weeks ago. Uh, if, you don't, if you don't believe, look into the internet and you will see that, that talk. But to see somebody like Mr. Barnes to talk without facts, without making any statement that you could understand as a reason to change one system for the other, then you say, what the heck are we, are we here for? Um, when I was in Europe, I forgot my medicine, and here I pay $15 co-pay for the full insurance that we have. And when I went there and I forgot my medicine, I went to the pharmacy, and they give me the same drug, Cardura, for a month for $9. Now, when people start buying the drugs in Canada because they were half the price, the government of the United States made it legal for us to buy the drugs in Canada. Now, what kind of a government we have and what kind of health system we have if this is a, what they say, a capitalist country, mm -hmm. I can buy my drugs whenever I fucking want to. All right! <laughs> now, uh, what, what, is, what is the living with the Damocles sword of your potential losing everything that you, you say for your early <coughs> days when you are only a, 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 an accident away from being in the hospital and losing everything if you don't have insurance? Uh, it's, it's just uh, part of the standard of living to live with that weight on it that make us in the United States much, much worse than we apparently are. Um, we solve the problem very fast. Demand that your senators and congressmen have the same insurance that we do. Uh -huh. And they will, they will change it right away. They have insurance. We pay for it. Very, very good insurance. They don't have to pay anything. Now, with that, with that in mind, ask them. Say, if you if you think this is so good, why don't you have it like us? Um, now, Mr. Mr. One Barnes minute, said Frank. that he want to put his retirement money in the bank. The banks that stole. The soul of this fucking country. I yes, you said that you you no, put no, it in no, your no. investments. <laughs> investments. They, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. You say you put it in investments. I mean, what kind of a silliness is that? That you are going to put what you need in absolutely need when you retire in the hands of these crooks. <laughs> I mean, if that makes sense, this is, this is what the mosquitoes do so. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Don't kid yourself. Aren't we a little bit too old to be believing these a-hole politicians? <laughs> if there was a bunch of four or five-year-old kids here, maybe they'd say, ooh-wee, the government's going to pay, the government's going to pay, wahoo. Wow. This last week, Governor Quinn said, we got to have speed cameras because if it'll save the life of one little child, just like in the Old Testament, the little darlings out there on the playground, the little darlings out there in the park, oh, to save the life of one little baby, <laughs> we got to have speed cameras. A speed camera is not going to stop a car from hitting a child. I don't care if you got a speed camera on every frame and quarter all over the world. A speed camera is not going to stop a car from hitting a child. It doesn't have a big arm to grab the car and yank it away from the child. But I guarantee you, somewhere along the line, there's a company that's selling speed cameras to the city, and they're paying a lot of bribe money to Quinn, and they're paying a lot of bribe money to Madigan, and they're paying a lot of bribe money to Emanuel. That's what speed cameras are for. Government-paid health care is a welfare program. It's not a welfare program for women that are living in housing projects. It's not a welfare program for little children. It's a welfare program for the medical industry. And not even doctors and nurses. Because the medical industry is going to start importing doctors and nurses from all kinds of foreign countries, like factories that are importing workers from all kinds of foreign countries. Doctors and nurses are going to come here from all kinds of foreign countries, from Asia and the Pacific, and they'll get paid about 25 bucks an hour, which works out to about $50,000 a year. Nothing wrong with $50,000 a year. But doctors aren't going to, okay, doctors aren't going to be making five and $600,000 a year off of government health insurance. Hospital administrators will. The people that own the corporations, that own the hospitals and the medical practices, they're the ones that are going to be paying billions of dollars in bribe money to politicians. And they're the ones that are going to be making hundreds of billions of dollars in profits. It's going to come out of our pocket. Get real. We've been listening to politicians too long. No matter what they said, guys said, a politician is lying when his lips are moving. Listen, a politician is lying when he's awake or when he's asleep. If the guy's talking in his sleep, he's lying to him. If he's in a nightmare, having a nightmare, screaming, ah! he's lying to you somehow when he's sleeping. Your time is up. Yes, holy. Yes. He's lying. I'm all for single care, but I would like to thank both of our speakers for having guts enough to face this group. Uh, you sure got more guts than I do. I, I couldn't do it. But you're uh, doing it now. Yeah, I'm, well, I'm doing a rebuttal. That's easy. Uh, uh, waste, uh, uh, Mr. Barnes says, oh, our military is so good. Geez, talk about waste. Well, we got 11 aircraft carriers. Gee, we need those real bad. We got uh, anywhere from seven to nine hundred bases around the world. We've been in Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, how many of us would really want to face death in either one of those? Hey, it ain't me, I'll tell you that. So much waste, it's incredible. Uh, uh, the, uh, there, I saw a film, and I got it at home, DVD, Sick Around the World talks about four countries, I forget all four of them, but I think it's Canada, Hong Kong, uh, and uh, one other that I forget, Canada, Hong Kong, and Switzerland, and maybe one other country, and tells about uh, what really good systems are around. I'll have to admit that I personally 
got two health uh, insurances and uh, and coverage, so I get good good coverage, and my health would be even better if I would eat less food. But uh, you know, I do get really good coverage, and there are some people in the country that get uh, really good care with our present system. <coughs> Uh, how do you improve it? Uh, the doctor said it's going to be tough. I, I fully agree with that. Democracy is difficult. I see Steve here. Um, I see Jim here. And uh, we, we've gone to see our, our people face to face. State representative, state uh, senator, uh, U.S. rep. Uh, we've tried to see our, our U.S. senators. It's almost impossible to get to those two guys. But we, we do what, what we can. It's difficult. You've got to go back again and again. Uh, you've got to organize. You've got to focus. You've got to hold people responsible. And it, uh, it's going to be a very, very difficult because the 1%'s got the money. And we've got something, though. If we unite and uh, focus, we, the people, eventually will prevail. Thank you. Okay, well, I asked Ms. Sheets a question about needs and money. She didn't answer that question, so yeah, she answered as if I had asked about the U.S. versus other countries. I'm going to imagine she thought she did answer the question. Mm -hmm. So what I'm going to do is try to cut to the chase on how these issues sort of fit with each other. Her drift was that the U.S. could be equal or better than these other countries, but the U.S. changes some stuff. That may very well be true. But given that medical technology is getting better by the year, if not by the day, and given my understanding that probably every single one of these countries that she met did what it did, even if it met all of the needs of the people, did what it did by going into gargantuan debt, a lot of them, okay, and cooking the books to hide the magnitude of what they were up to. I will wager that, let's say within a period of, I don't know, three years, that the lot of them have to make major cuts in providing for all of these, quote, needs, unquote. Now maybe, you know, who knows, with the accounting fraud techniques available to politicians and others nowadays, bankers, um, maybe they might even be able to kick the can down another year or two. But I'll tell you this, this country is running out of gas. The Greeks already ran out of gas, all right? Now they're going to have to either default outright, in which case they probably won't be able to borrow nothing, and they'll have to cut major, make major cuts, or they're going to have to, in any case, make major cuts in the goodies that they pass out in their effort to meet all these so-called needs. Well, within three years, there's going to be a run on U.S. Treasuries, if not also on Euro bonds or whatever the recent incarnation of those things are or are coming in the coming past to be. And when the party ends, the financial comeuppance will, I fear, be ferocious indeed. Now, the Greeks, their national sport, as I understand it, is evading taxes. Okay, when you get down to it. Um, I, I don't know how I, whether I would go so far as to compare American habits in that regard to them. Probably the Italians have it over us and the Greeks have it over the Italians. But insofar as the kind of stuff you want gets passed, where's the money going to come from? to pay all this. You're either going to have to raise tax rates and make tax evasion the national sport, or you're going to have to print, in which case the dollar crisis, the run on treasuries, won't come three years from now, but rather more like two or some insurance. such. You see, i got a minute left, right? Okay, okay. They're making all wow. that money. When people talk about needs, as if it's obvious what needs are, I was trying to drive at that it wasn't necessarily so obvious. That's one of the loaded words in the language. I, I'm going to wager that insofar as when people say they need this or that, 
they are thinking that that means even when they're 80 years old, they should be able to get a knee transplant or a hip transplant or whatever it is. Just shoot them. Yeah, well, well, okay. Where are you going to get the money to give all the 80 year olds the knee and the hip transplants? That's what it comes down to. Stop the wars. Yeah, they'll save some money, they'll save some money, but it ain't going to be enough to pay for all this. And Mr. Barnes made some reference. As, as I understand it, the wars do not account. Even DOD, even the whole of DOD does budget, does not account for the deficit. If you had no DOD spending at all, as I understand it, since World War II, you'd still have a national debt. Okay, so you can't that's gamble on the, well, whatever. <laughs> then someone's going to have to come and give us a speech friend. on that very subject. Well, thank you, Mr. Barnes. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, hearing you. It was a very refreshing to hear finally somebody get up here and talk that wants a smaller government and more liberty for people and more choice. And uh, I'm on the same same wavelength here as Mr. Barnes about free market incentives and how they work. Now, a hundred years ago, we didn't have to hear about these big health care problems. People paid for health care out of their own pocket. There was pretty good treatment. You know, we didn't have all the fancy stuff we have now, maybe, but people had the medical care. Doctors would come out to your house on a horse and buggy in the middle of the night and, and you know, deliver babies and administer medicine and things. Well, how could we get back to that? Well, what happened? Well, you know, we had to perhaps try the free market. Now, one thing that happened is that big government came along in between, and now, how much of our money do we pay in taxes? Uh, you know, out of our pocket every year. You add up all the sales taxes, the income taxes, you know, all the hidden taxes that are passed on, and everything. You know, probably what fifty percent or more, or something like that. So you're probably wondering, like, well, you know, I know Bob is going to somehow turn this around to Henry George somehow. Yep. Yeah, how's he going to tie in Henry George to this? Well, here's, here's, here's what it is. We've been paying taxes to fund the government when the government should be funded out of the economic rent of land. In other words, out of the, the land value is, what, is where the government funding should come from. Land is what we should all own here. And rather than uh, some guy uh, who inherited, you know, uh, some acre of desirable land down on, like, you know, Michigan Avenue in Huron or something, making, uh, you know, millions of dollars a month in rent uh, just on the location of the, on the land, instead of him privately pocketing that, that, of course, should be going to fund the government. Now, if he wants to make 10 or 15 percent on, uh, you know, the building or whatever for managing a building, and building, well, that's fine. But he shouldn't be making any money on that land, which was stolen from the Indians, you know, 200 years ago. Anyway, so the, the thing is, because of the fact we're paying all these taxes, I mean, how many of you think that if doctors didn't have to pay 50 or 60 percent of their income in taxes, plus the school bills they have to pay off and everything, how many people think you know medical bills would be a little cheaper? See, so that's the thing. Those country doctors back in you know, the early you know the 1900s, they didn't have this this burden of, of a 50 percent tax rate or 75 percent tax rate on top of all kinds of bills and everything. So if we got back to a more of a plus uh, with a with a land tax, the incentive that would do to produce, we would have no sales taxes, no income taxes, just a tax on land. Imagine the uh, the booming economy that we would have because there'd be opportunity land. There'd be nobody speculating buying land and holding it off the market to make it artificially go up higher in price, raising up the cost of production. So land would be available for you know, whoever wanted to, to, to use it, labor and capital could come together and work. So people would be making money, there'd be economic activity, they'd have money in their pocket, they would have to pay taxes out. And guess what? The free market economy, the free market would take care of this problem like it would most other problems, oh, like, oh, 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 and oh, oh, as a stopgap measure, maybe something like a voucher system would work. You know, if, uh, people, whether from their employee or from uh, from their employer, or if they were getting Medicare, if they would get some kind of voucher, five thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars, spend on how they wish. Some people might want to get a Cadillac health care plan. 
some people and, and then, then go ahead and keep eating like I do and uh, maybe, maybe not exercising Your time is up. or they might want to get a scale back plan and put their some money into a gym or something like that so by the way in Europe Europe's afford to have this Cadillac health care plan they've had for so long because we paid for the Cold War we defeated the Ruskies it was American workers that paid for the B-52s, the submarines, and all that stuff. Soviet Union. And they didn't pay for crap. Soviet uh, Union. Europe. Your and, time is up. And, they are, they are, and they're now in decline, and we're paying for World War IV, and, which they're not doing either. World War IV. I'm stuck in a quandary tonight. I am really stuck in a quandary. All I heard tonight was what I could hear on Fox News and maybe the liberal channels. I have yet to hear real solutions to the problem. Socialism. I have yet to hear real comprehensive ways to do things like reduce costs, to do things like reduce benefits. Maybe single payer will work. When you have every other country in the world using some kind of single payer system, maybe perhaps we ought to take a look at it. For me, it's very simple. There was a story like just last week on National Public Radio where Romney, when he was in, no, I'm sorry, the current governor that of Massachusetts was asked, what can we do to reduce health care costs? And he brought insurance executives in, he brought doctors in, he brought people in, and they would say the same platitudes every meeting. It wasn't until he denied the 30% increase that the insurance companies were looking for that real reform started. There is now in place, in at least some of the places in Massachusetts, not the pay per service model, but a pay per patient model. There are a number of other innovative things that can be done, but yet we don't hear about them. If you want a Cadillac health care system, you're going to have to pay for a Cadillac health care system. That means we may have to raise taxes. If you want good roads, you want good bridges, you want a government that functions well, you're going to have to pay for it. And like rent, and like food, and like utilities, that's what it's going to take. For me, it's very simple. If I want to live in a country that has a good government benefits and good things, it may take a 50% tax rate. Yeah. If you want to live in a country where there's loose regulation and free marketeering and all this stuff and the 25% tax rate and a little bit more fraud, go right ahead and move there. I'm sure you'll find plenty of banana republics in Africa that will take you with no problem. But for me, it's a simple matter. It costs money. If you want the benefits, be prepared to pay for them. Don't scream to lower taxes, but yet at the same time, get your special money from the government in the form of a welfare grant or a TIF or something else. What's good for the gander is good for the good for the person. <laughs> What's good for the goose is good for the gander, is what I'm saying. <laughs> the solution is a simple one. You have to make health care a universal good, much like police, much like fire, and much like roads and other public goods that the government delivers. We wouldn't be having this debate now if it was like this. Education is another one. Yeah, everybody talks about reforming it. The only thing that is wrong with education in our country is that we're not following the models like they're using in Asia and other countries where their kids are excelling and ours are not. Perhaps it's a matter of expectations, perhaps it's something else. I will conclude very simply. Thomas Friedman said we're falling behind because other people are imitating what we did 50 years ago and 
if we just start doing again what we were doing back then to get our country great, I think we can rise to that level of greatness. Before I begin the reply that I anticipated, I would like to state that I think that my good friend and fellow student, Bob Matter, would be happier if he lived in a world where William McKinley were still president of the United States. <laughs> I mean, back then, yeah, things were a lot simpler, Bob. All right. What do you with McKinley? <coughs> Yes. <laughs> During the Great Depression, when there was a hearing before the U.S. Senate on a committee of, of, of uh, before the U.S. Senate, a U.S. Senate committee on the problem, there was somebody who was arguing for more money to help starving people, and the witness said to one of the senators in response to a question. They don't eat in the long run, Senator. They eat every day. And I think that applies to the nation's health care problems as well. I've heard too many people, too many conservatives, run around this country and say, well, it really doesn't matter if people get hurt. Let, let private enterprise take care of it. We can't afford to do this any longer. And yes, we need a government health care program. And I heard a point of view expressed earlier that I found quite shocking. Well, what does it matter if people get hurt? People die every day. Yeah, people starve every day, too, and we shouldn't help them? I don't think so. Uh, the conservatives of this country have also argued against health care and come up with more with no solutions of their own. We used to have a mayor in this city, not Richard M. Daly, but his dad, Richard J. Yeah. Who, among other things, said, and I, and I quote, it's easy to criticize, to find fault, but where are their programs? Where are their priorities? Yeah. What trees do they plant? <laughs> sure is, don't seem to be planting any trees. If they're planting anything, it's just weeds. <laughs> <laughs> One question, uh, what comment I would have made was taken away by the lady who argued that health care is a part of our national defense. No kidding. How will we respond to a bioterrorism threat if our health care establishment is weak and underfunded? President Kennedy used to say that we are in for a long, and said in his inaugural address, that we are in for a long twilight struggle against the common enemies of mankind. And one of them is the struggle for decent health care. One Finally, minute. I will close by commenting or quoting an anecdote about a great American by the name of Earl Warren. Before he became Chief Justice, Earl Warren was a Republican, and he was governor of the state of California. He was elected three times, a record that thanks to term limits, no Californian will ever be able to beat. At the beginning of one of his terms, he was hospitalized for a fairly serious illness. I don't know what it was. And he was in the hospital for several weeks. And while he was in the hospital, Governor Warren Thought to, my, thought to himself, here he was getting the best of medical care from an outstanding hospital, but what if I were a blue-collar mechanic like my father? Who would, pay, who would take care of my family? Who would pay my medical bills? And so when he got out of the hospital, he sent the California legislature a modest by our standards, but it was more than many other people, including most Republicans, were offering then. Uh, a bill to create a new health, a new health care plan for California, and he tried to vet it out by addressing the California Medical Association, which hollered socialism and shot it down. Well, he said to the legislature anyway, which rejected it after a huge, huge rallying effort by the CMA and by the big political consulting firms out there. The bill lost, and Earl Warren was left very bitter. Thank you. Okay. Um.
I guess I am very, very tired of people saying uh, our budget is shot and we have to take out cuts in public services. Um, the, we went to a talk this afternoon at the Open University of the Left from a guy from uh, a professor at uh, DePaul. He wrote an article in Common Dreams called Half of America in Poverty. The facts say that it's true. And what he really was talking about, um, or at least one of the themes, was that what, what has happened is that we are not supporting, you know, our taxes are not the problem. We, uh, that half of American corporations do not pay any taxes at all. There's a, one building in the Cayman Islands that is the home for 19,000 corporations, because if they have a home in the Cayman Islands, their profits, they don't have to pay taxes on their profits. So that what we have is a, a, is a, a wholesale shift of the costs of, of government, or the, or the price of government, to the 99%, or even actually the, maybe the 90%, from the wealthiest people in this country. So that when you look at what people, that, that, that corporations don't even pay the taxes that they're supposed to pay. Half of them don't pay any at all. The ones that pay taxes don't pay what they're supposed to pay. And what happens is that the rest of us then have to bear the burden of that because the services that we rely on like health care and education, the funding for those are being cut because the taxes that we're able to pay are not enough to support those services. Now, in terms of health care, it, it, there's all kinds of studies that show that health care that health care provided under national health care plan, under single party single party payer plan where the government is the insurance company, by far is less expensive than this private system that we have of the health insurance companies that are for profit making profit and uh, and, and uh, health executives that we you know making eight million dollars a year and having three or four 24 million dollar houses and it just basically uh, it, it being obscene in, in their consumption of money because they've cut services and cut uh, cut costs by denying benefits to people who have paid the money. So they make that money and take it home. So the the, uh, the the people who, one of the points that this man made is that not only we pay income taxes in this lower 99%, uh, <coughs> we also pay uh, Taxes like on food and, and liquor, of course, in our case, and a, a lot of other things, but things that we have to use. It, it, you know, the, you, you pay your telephone bill, you pay taxes. So that in, instead of the 15% the, uh, uh, the that's the bottom percent people pay in taxes, by the time you get up into the middle income levels, you pay about 24% of your wages in taxes. In addition to that, you pay other taxes and, uh, and, and when you buy things that you need. So he said we pay to an average. Time's up. We, oh, no. I have, yes. If anybody Ten wants seconds. this article, then yeah. uh, I've got the citation, and it has some really good statistics about who pays and who doesn't pay. All right. Okay, well, this was a real interesting presentation tonight, and it's an issue on which, you know, I, which I have a particular interest because uh, I don't know how many, but because I don't have medical insurance, and um, and so so I took an especial interest in Obamacare because uh, or, or because because you know it would affect me a great deal, you know. Um, now, I, I just first of all, so now for. I will just say for the record that for purely selfish, you know, for purely selfish reasons, I support it because I, I kind of studied it and, 
and, uh, and the various the, the details of it, which are, which are available to the public. You can read about it on the internet. And, um, One second. And, uh, and I learned that I personally would benefit from it, so I said, okay, I'm in favor of it then. I don't think it's perfect, but and I, th this is, uh, I don't think it's a perfect system, but I think it is an improvement on what we've got now. And sometimes, um, you know, um, I actually, uh, sometimes you, you know, you, you move a little bit in the right direction. Now, I, I just want to say, Bob, that, that uh, you were talking about how great medical care was in the 19th century. Um, I, I would be more inclined to agree with Jeff on this, that I think medical care now in the 21st century is, is a good deal better than it was back in the 19th when the average life expectancy in this country was about 50. Um, and, uh, and by the way, one of the reasons that medical bills have gone up so much is because we have technology such as MRIs and things that were not available to people 120 years ago. Now, um, I want to just also say that um, on this subject, that I, I felt that um, we, we there, there are some areas, the, the speakers are supposed to be on opposite sides, but there are some areas, there's, I don't know how that's going to look on camera if you're walking off stage, but, uh, but there are some areas where the speakers agree, and one area where the speakers seem to agree, uh, and where obviously I already disagree with them, is that Obamacare has got to go. Obamacare is not unsatisfactory. Uh, then now uh, our uh, Dr. Sheets, uh, who uh, Dr. Sheets um, uh, advocates a, a single payer system, and I, I don't have a problem. With that. Now, uh, uh, Mr. I'm not exactly sure what Mr. Barnes advocates, um, as, as I understand it, uh, he, he advocates eliminating uh, fraud from the existing system, uh, making the affordable health care voluntary, and replacing Medicare with vouchers, is that correct? I wasn't, didn't hear the whole lecture because I had to go out. Is that, is that correct, sir? Uh, well, let me just go on, I'll, I'll just continue. I don't want to, okay, I don't want to use up all my, use up all my time here. Well, let me just, let me just say right now that there's a, a movement among some, among some of the Republicans in Congress advocating that, that Medicare be replaced with a voucher system. Now, I just want to ask everybody here in the audience. One ever, minute. Oh, one minute. Okay. All right. I want to ask everybody here in the audience, how many, how, and I want you to tell, be honest, everybody that, everybody that, that receives Medicare now, raise your hand. Everybody raise your hand. Okay. Go, okay. Everybody. Oh, the, the, Mr. Mr. Okay. Mr. Barnes, you get Medicare too. Oh my God. Oh my gosh. Uh, Pat. Oh my God. Okay. Okay. I don't, I'm too, too young for it. Okay. Everybody keep your hands. Now I want to ask you all again, how many of you let me explain the voucher system. The voucher system, you don't get Medicare anymore. What you get is a voucher, a few thousand dollars, which you can use to buy insurance from any com company that will give you insurance. All right? How many of you would prefer that to your current system? Okay, Mr. Barnes. Okay. All right. That's it. kind of stole a little bit of my, my thunder, uh, but not quite. Uh, it was uh, said that uh, Bob here would be happiest when McKinley was president. Uh, actually, I think McKinley himself would not have been happy when he was president, particularly after he had been shot. Why? After he had been shot, the big concern was, can they find a doctor in Buffalo, New York? who has enough training, adequate medical training, to uh, take care of this kind of an injury. There were lots of doctors around. But remember, until the Flexner Report of 1910-1911 came out, medical schools, many of them, were diploma mills. You didn't have to even go to medical school to become a doctor. You could apprentice under another doctor then take a medical exam when you were ready, much like you did, you know, when you uh, sat for your law exams. Then take a medical exam, and yeah, the chances are you probably knew how to take care of the average uh, cuts and bruises and ills like that. But uh, were you the type of doctor that you would want to trust your life to? Probably not. In those days, the average age of an American at death was about 40. 
Now, I grant you, visiting a doctor in those days was about 25 cents, 50 cents in some places. Uh, operations ran about 10 or 15 dollars, uh, whether you lived or not. Uh, the truth of the matter is that at the beginning of the Civil War, they were so short of doctors, competent doctors, that they found veterinarians <laughs> were better trained to serve the wounded than some of the MDs of that period. This is, you know, medical education as we know it today is a luxury that only came in the 20th century. Uh, good God, a uh, hundred years ago, I could have gotten into medical school. <laughs> that should scare everybody in this room, <laughs> really. <laughs> Um, so, you know, before we, you know, long for the good old days uh, that our grandparents and great-grandparents knew, I think we should realize that had we lived in that period, most of us would not be sitting here today. Uh, you know, so yes, medical care costs more. But I submit, as one other speaker suggested, we look back at what it was like yeah, before 1859 here in Chicago when fire service was fee for service oh, and the fire departments minute. were run by the insurance companies. It was only after a major disaster on Lake Street in 1857 that they began thinking in terms of a professionalized fire department that provided free service uh, to uh, all uh, residents of Chicago. Uh, yes, you paid for it out of your taxes. Yes, it cost money, but yes, everyone was taken care of. Police service. Do you know there was a time in London and in Paris when if you wanted police protection, you could get it, but you paid for it. You know, you, you went for, to the prefect of police in Paris, or you went to the proper people in London, and they would, you know, they would provide you uh, with uh, bodyguards and whatever, and you paid for it. It was only after Sir Robert Peel uh, became Home Minister uh, in England, that uh, police service was provided, you know, free to all citizens. Your now, time there were some is citizens up. citizens who objected to that and wished that it hadn't happened. Uh, but uh, the fact of the matter is that what we take for granted today, schools, up until about the 1830s, schools in the United States were not free. Whether they were non-sectarian or whether they were uh, uh, religious-based, the fact of the matter is that you paid for uh, education, Your time and my up. time oh. is up. Um, hello, hi. Uh, thank you very much for your speeches. Um, They're very informative. Um, I'm a little tired tonight, so I probably won't say that much. Um, I sort of in favor of, of the Obama plan, but I think the universal single-payer plan is probably much better. Um, originally, I, I was thinking um, kind of positively about uh, the Obama health care because there are so many people now who don't have health insurance. Um, I don't have health insurance. Um, and um, but now I'm seeing that there, there are a lot of problems. I was very surprised to find out recently that 21%, 21% of the people in Illinois are on Medicaid. And um, this is why Quinn keeps on talking about it. I didn't hear the recent budget talk but, um, by Quinn. Um, but I'm pretty sure that he wants to cut payment to Medicaid positions. And already, a lot of physicians will not take Medicaid patients because the payment is the payments are too low, and in some cases, there's they don't even cover the cost of the care, uh, the basic cost for of the, the X-rays or blood tests or whatever. So that's extremely problematic because um, under Obamacare, all these new people are going to be added to the Medicaid um, payments. The Medicaid rolls. Um, I'd be curious to know whether, you know, they're going to get more money from the federal government in that case, or, or what's going to happen. But you know, that's that's really depressing if you have medical insurance, but you know, you very few doctors will see you. Um, 
that will be extremely problematic. I know that um, last September, um, I don't know whether it was all the physicians or just like specialty physicians, um, the orthopedic doctors, um, there was a 30% cut in their payment to Medicaid doctors. So there's, there's been a big cut. Um, I know somebody who works at um, Midwest Orthopedics at Rush, and they, they cut the doctor's payments by 30% for the Medicaid patients. Um, I do strongly believe that universal health care is a right. Um, we can choose to get a car or not, but we can't choose whether we're born, and once we're born, we're all going to need health care. There are going to be some few individuals who, you know, basically never see a doctor their whole life and then just kind of drop dead. But, you know, that's the minority. Um, just last year, last winter, I, I happened to be running just a little bit. There wasn't any ice. It was the winter, but there wasn't any ice. But I just happened to somehow lose my balance. I, not like I was carrying anything, but I just somehow lost my balance. I fell on my knees. Um, I ended up having to do quite a bit of um, physical therapy. Um, One minute, I, Ellen. So, you know, I, I, and there's, all, there's all sorts of expenses. Luckily for me, you know, I had some savings. My parents helped me out some. You know, so, you know, there, you can be one accident away from, from all sorts of problems. Um, and, uh, however, I do think that if we do have some kind of um, single-payer system, that there should be some disincentive for people to abuse the system and just, you know, see the doctor endlessly for, you know, just because they're kind of hypochondriacs. Um, there should be some disincentives, um, but but never the, nevertheless, um, you know, people should be um, given health care. I don't know whether, you know, e even nowadays, people who are on Medicare and stuff like that, they're not giving a whole bunch of Your time surgeries is up. to 90 year olds. Okay, thank you. Good job. Speaker gets the last yeah. word. Yeah, just give me, give me, give me. Okay, um, several points I want to make. Number one, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we need to understand the difference between the deficit and the debt, okay? Right now, we're running roughly about 15.3 15, trillion dollars in debt. The deficit is running about 1.3 trillion. That means that. <clears throat> we're simply paying out more money than we take All right, so, so we're talking about paying for any type of health care. The question is where the money will come from. That's the first part. Now, secondly, the, the, the issue about the Medicaid, uh, I think was already mentioned, but roughly about 40% of the physicians are not even taking Medicaid anymore because the payments are just too simple and low. And my, my mother, before she passed away, her doctor got out, her, her doctor got out of practice. Not only because of the low Medicaid payment, but because of the malpractice insurance was too high also. And, and, and this is what driving a lot of doctors out of, out, of, out of private practice, the malpractice insurance as well as the low Medicaid payment. And so we, when we talk about reform, we have to look at the big picture here. There's some whole, some serious areas that have to be reformed. Now the other thing I want to mention about has to do with has to do with the uninsured. Even if Obama care has proved to be constitutional, which I doubt. But even if it was proved to be constitutional, you're still going to have 20, 29 million people. Just not insured. Just, just, it's still not going to be insured. The other thing I want to mention, too, has to do with, has to do with the, the, uh, the, uh, somebody mentioned about the, the taxes. I want to just talk about taxes for a little bit. The corporation taxes and military bases around the world and all this kind of stuff. Now, and I, and I mentioned, see, the, there's money out there that could be used to provide health care for people not insured. But the money has to be taken, see, the money has to be taken from areas that, it, that is already being wasted in. That's the whole point I was making. Now, military bases, I would take the position that we do have a lot of unnecessary military bases. We have military bases. And I served in Korea. We still got military bases in Korea. We still got military bases in Germany. We still, we still got military bases in a lot of places in the world. That should not be. We can reduce those bases, reduce those costs of those bases, 
and, and redirect those costs and redirect those money to provide health care to people who don't have it. I mean, there are a lot of ways it can be done without raising taxes. Now, in terms of corporations, that like corporations, <coughs> and there's a whole point about corporations not paying taxes. Well, what did their proposal out there for a flat tax and, re and reduce the loopholes? You know, get rid of the loopholes, reduce the taxes, then you're going to have corporations paying taxes because they don't have any loopholes to deal with in, in order to to, to, uh, to have money from tax being taxed. So, I mean, there are proposals out there which we do. If we look at the proposals of Forget about, forget about what party the politicians did, was Democrat or Republican. Look at the policies and say, okay, how, what, 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 how, how <clears throat> if these policies become law, what impact would it have on not only, what, have, what impact would it have on the economy? That's what we look at. That's what we look at. Forget about parties and all this kind of nonsense. Look at the policies and evaluate the policies. Now, let me just conclude by talking about how health care can actually be reformed. I think there should be no, no <coughs> medical no practice reform. There has to be in order for all the doctors to be able to stay in private practice and serve more people. There has to be the opportunity to buy policies across state. And you can buy auto policies across state. You can buy auto policies from a company like Geico that's based in Maryland someplace. But we can't but we can't do that with health care. We need competition across state lines with health care also. The competition across state lines will actually reduce the cost. And then thirdly, we need to we don't need one health plan, we don't need to we need to be able to, to choose the type of the type of benefits that we want in our health care plan. We don't need one size fit all type of health plan. See, if you if you block grant money to the state, then you let then you let the state decide how money ought to be spent. Then you let people have the decision what type what type of benefits in the health care plan health care plan they want. All these kind of areas would put the competition out there and out there allow the allow the cost to come down. So that's that's basically how we can reduce the cost of health care. I mean that's just some fundamental ideas that we can consider. And then our politicians know about what we want to do. Okay, let's get we got one more speaker. We are already paying for a Cadillac healthcare system. We're just not getting it. We're paying, yes. we're paying yeah. more than eight thousand yeah. dollars per person per year for healthcare. Yeah. 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 You just take that money and Don't put it into one fund and use that money to pay for healthcare <coughs> instead of paying it for administration of the multiple yes. health insurance companies. Then we have enough money. We do have enough to pay for any healthcare that people need. Um, the problem with vouchers, any kind of Anything, any kind of way that you arrange health care that depends on private insurance companies. Again, insurance companies are in it for profit. You make a profit by shedding risk. You make a profit by not paying for sick people. As long as you have insurance companies, they're going to find ways to not pay for sick people. So you buy, you get a voucher, you use it to buy health insurance. You need health insurance. The insurance company rejects your claim. So that's what you have. The, the way to, to avoid that is to have a single system, a Medicare system, whose job is to pay for health care and for people to get the health care that, that you need. <laughs> this is the system that I advocate, and again, this is an evidence-based policy, and the documentation uh, for it is at pnhp.org. Thank you. Thank you.